This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. This is a special town council meeting in, and it in fact is a public forum. Uh, we are meeting based on governor's Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which allows us to hold virtual town council meetings. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the special meeting of the town council to order at 631. I will call upon each counselor by name. They should let me know that they can hear us and we can hear them. And this will indicate us that we can go ahead with the meeting. Uh, this meeting includes video, audio, and is available live on Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room. If you have technical issues, please let me or Athena know. And we will make note of that in the record. So with that, I'm going to go ahead with the roll call. And Athena, could you just take the slide down for the moment? Thank you. Um, Shalini Balmilne. Here. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Here. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. And Sarah Schwartz. Present. I want to note that there are a couple of other people who are here who are part of the Finance Committee. They are the resident non voting members. And then there may be other people who have joined us early for later on in the meeting. <clears throat> this uh, forum is specifically on the Jones Library. It is on two financial orders, and it particularly is one order relating to the Community Preservation Act, where that committee has uh, specifically voted to grant the library a million dollars based on historic preservation. The second order is a borrowing order to fund the expansion of the Jones Library. It's a bond authorization. With that, I'm going to just go ahead and ask people who are interested to start raising their hands. And let me just mention one or two other things. In preparation for this meeting tonight, and later on in the meet in the regular council meeting, the town council has held four capital listening sessions in December of 2018. We've had a minimum of three town council meetings over a period of two plus years to receive various reports and to discuss their findings. Those were held on February 11th, 2019, July 13th, 2020, and February 22nd, 2021. We held two public forums on the repair and or renovation expansion options of the Jones Library. Those were on March 5th and 10th, 2021. And the Finance Committee has held two meetings to discuss at length um, the uh, questions and answers. And that 60 page document is in your folder tonight. As of this morning at 1037, we had 268 emails to the town council. We have received quite a number since then, but the count stays just about the same. Uh, about 72% support the library expansion and renovation and about 27 oppose it. Eight comments have been inconclusive and we are trying to do this to identify unique individuals. So with that, I'm going to be calling on people who have raised their hands to make public comment. And please make, make note that it's 635.
Eugene Gafrido. Please enter the room, state your name, where you live, and your please. Hi, uh, I'm Eugene Gofredo. I live in South Amherst on Middle Street. I didn't hear the last thing that you wanted me to say. That's exactly what I wanted you to say. Ah, perfect. Come <laughs> um, three minutes. I may have to shorten that later, but we'll see. Okay. I'll be quick. Um, I just want to go on record. I am in full support uh, borrowing for the renovation and expansion for the Jones. Uh, the library really needs to be rebuilt for the next 30 to 50 years. The, the in-person programming that needs to be done now is a lot more diverse with a lot more complex technical dependencies. You know, information flows, whether it's borrowing books, accessing stuff um, online, um, accessing electronic resources is just very different now than it's been for, you know, literally the past half century. So we need to build with some forward thinking. And I think it's a really good opportunity now because interest rates are low. We have a really nice confluence of state and private money that could really help finance this. Um, so I think it's, it's just really imperative that we do move forward on this and we can't know everything um, you know, that will happen. There's, there's always risk when you do anything, but I'm really confident that the planning and the management that have gone into this, I've been pretty amazed as I've watched the, the meeting from the transcript. So um, that's what I wanted to say, um, full, full support for the expansion and the, the borrowing that's needed for it. Thank you. I also wanna note that in addition to the council, uh, Representative Mindy Dom has joined us in the audience this evening. Todd Holland, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Todd Holland. I also live in South Amherst on One Elf Hill Road. And I served on the Library Sustainability Committee along with Sharon and Alex from the library and with Lee, Sarah, and Chris, who I have worked with on other projects. Um, I am a professional engineer, uh, but I'm not working as an engineer on this project. Um, but I have been very satisfied and impressed with the architects, with their responses, and the changes to the design that they made uh, based on our questions, comments, and observations on, um, that allowed the design to evolve based on our experience in the industry and with green buildings. I worked with Sarah on the RW Kern Center at Hampshire College. Um, we got that building fully certified as a living building, which to my knowledge is the most stringent green building standard in the world. It was only the 17th in the nation. And my experience there is that it's really not a prescriptive approach that works. Um, you can talk R values and EUIs. It really comes down to how the building is used and operating and operated in practice. That is the real challenge. And also having been in that building for uh, several years that the promise of the building isn't fully realized until you, you start using it and you see what a gem it is and see what it means to the people who work there and go there every day. Um, it was really satisfying to see the Kern Center take shape and become a, a real living building. And uh, this design library as a parent of three kids who came up through the, the Amherst schools, I would love to see this building done. And as somebody who has worked at the local colleges specifically in energy and sustainability for approximately 20 years, most of the arguing and hemming, hemming and hawing can result in inaction and inaction is guaranteed to be the only wrong move to make. So I would love to see this thing move forward and it looks like a really good step to me. Thank you for your comments, Todd. Chris Riddle, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Chris. Hi, uh, Chris Riddle a retired architect, 
I live on 252 Strong Street in Amherst. Um, and I, what I was prepared to, about to say was almost identical to what Todd just said. We have very similar backgrounds. And, um, and, we, and we, I would change the part about the Kern Center to read Hitchcock Center. And, uh, and I would change the thing about having kids to having grandkids. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I've, I've been working, I was happy to work on the sustainability committee for this project that really raised, raised my consciousness about where the, um, the administration and the board's um, collective heads are at as far as uh, sustainability and, um, uh, and natural and, and using uh, low carbon um, products in the building. It, this is, a, uh, I'm proud of this project. I, I think we'll all be proud of it. I think it's, it's time to do, uh, uh, to every, every 50 years or so, it's time to uh, re-up and, and re-energize our infrastructure. It's not the best time in terms of, of uh, the pandemic. It's not the best time uh, well, it's never the best time, um, uh, but this is this is the time when the when the state money is there, and I would just hate to say no to it again, as we did once before um, on, on the school project. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I think this is it's, now's the time to do this project. We should just we should um, uh, uh, take the opportunity to. Um, raise the, uh, our investment in our, in our beloved library. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this project. I hope we all, I hope we make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Judith Swain, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, Judith Swain, I live at 565 Bay Road in Amherst and can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. So I've lived in Amherst and, and, and Pelham uh, since 1973. And in that time, I've spent a lot of time at the Jones. And like everybody, I'm sure on this call, we love the Jones. And I'm a, a wholehearted supporter of this project for a variety of reasons. The space that is now the children's room is just abysmal. And when before the previous renovation, it was a wonderful place to be with small children. And what we have now is just awful. Um, and I'm, I've looked at these plans and I think that the opportunities for children and youth in this project are fabulous. I'm also a, I've been a tutor in the ELL program. And as other people have said, not tonight, but in other forums, the, the space for tutoring people in second language is not enough for the number of people that are using this building for that purpose. And uh, I just feel like the previous speaker that this is the time to do this project. And I'm thrilled to hear two architects and uh, engineer types who say that this is going to be a sustainable building because that is obviously what we need to do right now. So I really hope that this project goes forward. I feel like the, um, the Jones Library is the center of our community. It will continue to bring people to our community and it will be the jewel of the downtown. So I hope you support this project. Thank you. Judith, thanks for joining us tonight. The next person is a call-in user. Uh, please identify yourself and where you live. Yes, my name is Vincent O'Connor. I live I at 175 Summer Street in Amherst. I've lived here since 1974. And I was the initial sponsor of the CPA article before town meeting in the early part of the century and the sponsor of the two increases in the CA, CPA uh, percentage that raised it to 3%. And as such, and a member of the committee for six years from, I think, 2005 to um, 2011. And as such, I, I do not feel that the amount of money being committed to this building uh, in the name of historic preservation is 
um, is really appropriate um, given the nature of the proposed uh, demolition and uh, of, of various historic features. Um, with respect to the building itself, um, as somebody who who's used and is concerned about the branch libraries, I am very concerned that there will be not insufficient funds, both in the endowment and in future, and in uh, future appropriations to staff both this expanded building and and the branch libraries. And finally, um, as somebody who has brought eight to 10 children of color to the children's room, one, I don't think it's, it meets, I, I found it quite welcoming and relaxing for the kids. They found it welcoming and relaxing. Um, I, I do not support a building concept that um, empowers or directs or however you want to put it, a primi primarily white staff to become visual controllers of as much space as they can visually control uh, and do their other duties. I think this is having untrained people do this as part of the direction of, the, of this library construction is in this current era a very foolish um, uh, enterprise. And uh, I do not share the, um, the negative comments about the existing children's room by any of the folks who have made them. So I do not support the project. I do not support the use of CPA funds for the project. And I would urge city councilors to not vote for the project. Thank you. Vince, thanks for joining us this evening. Rebecca Major. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry, it doesn't say. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I'm here with my husband, Craig Cannell. We live at 151 Amity Street in Amherst, just a little bit down from the library. And we were just here to add our voices to those who are supporting the project. Uh, we haven't uh, been able to attend any of the previous sessions and uh, we did not write a letter. We probably should have, um, but we didn't. And so we wanted to come here and say that we, we support the project um, for many of the reasons that have been stated. Uh, but I also wanna say that the fact that the library really does not currently have an operational teen space uh, is something that's long been a concern for me as someone, I have been a high school librarian before and I care a lot about the teens in our community. And I think this project will go a long way toward helping that. Uh, and it looks great. I have no expertise in looking at architectural plans, um, but it, it looks lovely and we, we wanna fully support it. Thank you. Thank you, um, and welcome to Amherst. Sarah Draper, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, just a little mic check, you can hear me? Yes. Awesome, thank you. So I'm Sarah Draper. I actually live in Northampton. I work at Hampshire College um, as the aforementioned director of the RW Current Center, our net zero, low carbon, friendly neighborhood living building. Um, my background is in sustainable design and historic building preservation. Um, and as both Todd and Chris mentioned, I was also a member of the Jones Library Sustainability Committee in helping to shape this, our sustainability goals for this project. Um, so I just wanted to add um, my support for the Jones Library renovation and expansion project. I think this is a wise investment you know, this project will reduce the town's dependence on fossil fuels, lower the energy costs of the library, and better provide for the needs of all the town's residents. Um, that in itself would be enough for me to pass the should we, shouldn't we test. But I'm personally excited that this project can also provide an example and a template for what sustainable historic preservation and renovation can look like, because that is what we need for 
the future. We are not going to like new building our way out of the climate crisis. We need to figure out how to make the buildings we have better. And I think this is a, a great example of doing that. Um, I will also just say that I'm really glad that so many people in Amherst and that the counselors are thinking critically about building sustainability and what the town should be spending our you know, energy and carbon budgets on to fulfill the climate goals that we have. Um, I think this energy efficient project is exactly where we should be spending those resources. Um, we know we can do nothing. The library systems are at the end of their useful life. And at this point in the climate change crisis, there is nothing worse than a missed opportunity. We need to reduce the energy use and our carbon use right now. And this is the project that's gonna help move the town of Amherst towards that, which is the direction we need to point. So just fully support. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Lisa Lieberman, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, I'm Lisa Lieberman. I'd like to offer the perspective of an author and compulsive reader. I live in North Amherst and I've lived here for 18 years. We've raised our children here. And in the course of my time using the library, I've developed relationships with many librarians. And I just like to say, I applaud their dedication to readers and to the community I've spoken to many of them over the years privately, and I've listened to their reasons for supporting this project. And I think what it really comes down to is that this project will enable them to do their jobs and to serve this community better. I happen to be president right now of the New England chapter of Sisters in Crime, which is a mystery writing organization. And in that capacity, I've presented programs at the Jones Library and throughout New England at various libraries. And when I visit these libraries, I see spaces that are welcoming, that are open, that are light-filled, that are used by all different constituencies. And then when I come back and I look at our library, I feel sad because here we are, a community that is you know, academically rich, we are intellectuals, we are readers, and we don't have libraries that reflect that about ourselves. We don't serve all the members of our community. So, you know, I'm speaking both as an author and as somebody who cares deeply about all of the members of our community, not just the readers, not just the writers, not just the academics, but children, people of color, English language learners. And I believe that this is the way that we need to move forward in order to meet the demands and the hopes of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Adrian Terezi. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You need to unmute, Adrian. Uh, I'm sorry, Lynn and everyone, that raised hand function refuses to lower. I'm listening intently. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Sorry, folks. Thank you. It should have a lower hand, Lynn. Okay. Can you, uh, Athena, can you bring Adrian? Oh, I guess you wanted to lower your hand. Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other public comments? Carol Gray, please enter the room and state your name. Hello, uh, Carol Gray, A15 Southeast Street in Amherst. I would like to talk about process and the need for getting the pulse on the community. What I'm very concerned about is that this seems to me like a top-down process. With something as important as spending $20 million and with there being four capital projects that are in the mix, two of which I think have much higher priority with the community, both Fort River 
Elementary School and the Wildwood Elementary School need to be rebuilt, you could take the 20 million that you're spending on rebuilding a library and you could rebuild one of those neighborhood schools now. You could, bound, bound, you could bond out the money and you could have started building that two years ago. <laughs> we have the money and we, could, we certainly have the credit rating and we could have started building one of those elementary schools immediately and then we could have gotten a grant for the second. I'm very concerned that this small body, um, and yes, there are people calling in, but there should have been a town-wide survey done to figure out how does the community want to spend our money? And uh, you have a fire department, a DPW, two elementary schools, and a library. How would the people prioritize those capital expenditures? And I think part of why there's been no effort to find that out is because you would find that most people would rank the library as one of the lowest priorities if they'd rank it at all. Many people would say they don't want it to be built. They don't think that 20 million to tear down a library that many still love and find useful the way it is um, to be a good use of money. Um, in terms of, I, I've read the critiques about how if we don't do this, we're gonna to have to spend 15.8 million in renovations. I think that's a false number and I'll tell you why. Um, it was <laughs> compiled by people who want to build the, the new library. <laughs> when you have people who already have an agenda, which is to, to spend 20 million to get this grant to, to do this huge library, of course the renovations are going to be priced at a very high number. And here's the other reason I think that it's a very high number. I was a Jones Library trustee for three years. I was on the buildings committee. I was the representative to the Joint Capital Planning Committee. I served on the Long Range Planning Committee as a, in all of these capacities, there was never any talk about how we need millions to renovate the library. We were on the, the Joint Capital Planning schedule for our 10 year plan to get various things replaced in a timely way. Um, so if, if your agenda is to justify a $20 million expenditure, is it any surprise that the cost of renovation comes close to that? Not to me. This was not done by an objective group that was really trying to assess what's, what are the emergency or, or even just current day needs. Um, if you're trying to build a state of the art library, okay, um, maybe 15.8 million, but would you, would you justify buying a new home by deciding that you want to um, gut your current home and that the price comes close to a new purchase? Anyway, so my point is, um, there should be a town-wide survey and there never was. And so it's, to me, it's, it's a top-down process from the library. And this is a top-down form of government that is not surveying the people. And you're gonna price out of town people who can't afford the higher taxes. And you might risk the, the override for the schools because some people might say, wait a second, this took 20 million and they put it towards a library instead of prioritizing the schools that we all think are most critical. Um, I don't, to me, it's kind of incredible that this has come this far when the, the town spoke loud and clear that we want to prioritize new elementary schools. Why are we talking about this right now? I, and I get that it's because there's a grant, but you can't do four capital plan, four capital expenditures within a, a half decade period of time. And, and if we want to be a town just for the wealthy, <laughs> you can't keep raising taxes and, and you, you, you should prioritize the things that the town uh -huh. I and need you to survey. Yeah, oh, okay. I'll say one last thing. There actually was a random survey done uh, to plan for the uh, the master plan. It was 665 Amherst citizens were chosen at random, and I'm going to quote from that random survey that was done. I really it's need a, to wrap up. It's one sentence. This is directly from the random survey. Overall, these random survey results indicate citizen satisfaction with the town the way it is. That was an objective random survey. You should do an objective random survey before you spend 20 million from the town's funds. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I wanna remind people that you're limited to three minutes. Claudia Pasmani, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi there, I'm Claudia Pasmani. I'm at uh, 47 Emily Lane. And uh, my first comments are as a resident. 
and uh, a longtime resident and uh, raised my family here as well. And I just want to firstly thank the Jones Library staff and trustees for their enormous efforts in getting us to this historic moment. I want to thank the town council um, for, for really taking the process in. I want to um, find the words for this team, but it's really hardly possible. But this is what I'd like to say to this team, this library team. One, I would like to say that who during the pandemic, they kept programs going for moms and littles, for seniors. They created some life-saving programming. They pivoted at every turn. They offered pickup at each branch. They curated book of the month club where they picked books out for you based on your preferences. They, they, they created homebound delivery. They, picked, they created um, outdoor browsing and computer tent outside. They created services for the children. There's a huge online presence with art prompts, take and make art kits, story time with librarian designed just for the, the users in mind, teens sharing across the library systems via Zoom. They actually even found that risk conversation circles transferred readily to Zoom. This is the library team that we've entrusted um, during the, probably the most difficult time. And to me, this is the team that I entrust to this expansion and this renovation. So thank you. Um, and speaking really quickly um, with a comment as executive director of the Amherst Area Chamber, uh, I echo the sentiments expressed earlier by the experts who spoke before me, Eugene, Todd, Chris, Rebecca, Sarah, um, in creating this true living building um, and creating this true economic and ecosystem driver. Uh, so we are on the verge of this exciting infrastructure changes in and around the downtown uh, that will build momentum as we all try to rise out of this, this horrific pandemic. I see this as a true opportunity as, this chamber, as, as, a, as the chamber, and I look to the town council as the chamber um, and how proud you should be to sit on this precipice of making this historic vote. I say, we, we say at the chamber, let this building rise as we all rise from this terrible time and let's soar. Thank you. What do you <laughs> Johanna Newman, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you so much. Johanna Newman, 137 Stanley Street. Um, I am so excited that we're so close to passing this. Amherst can afford all four of our capital projects. We made a huge mistake in 2016 when we turned away a state grant to replace our flawed and failing elementary schools. And I have to say, I personally find it a little bit galling to hear vocal opponents of the schools project come onto this meeting and say that schools should be the priority. We cannot afford to turn away state money. All four of these projects are necessary. They all serve diverse constituencies in our town and I urge you to vote yes tonight to update the Jones Library and bring it into the 21st century. Thank you. Johanna, thank you for your comments. Lee Jennings, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Lee and I live in Strong Street, on Strong Street. And I sent the counselors an email with my thoughts on the project. I don't wanna um, go through all of that again in the interest of time, but I am calling to support the project um, I know a lot about it, having served on the sustainability committee, and I uh, know that this building will help us meet our climate goals in the town and also will provide a space for um, teenagers, which I will have in a few years, that do not have a space in the library um, right now. And um, also feel like We've seen um, the way forward to achieve these four capital projects. And <clears throat> it will be great to have one that the entire town can enjoy, which is the library, unlike the schools and DPW and fire station, which we absolutely need to do, but they're not places that are accessible to everyone. And I hope that you'll remember um, that there's lots of people that can't call into all of these meetings and email, and they're the ones that may benefit the most from this project, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Lee, thank you for joining us. Sarah Eisinger. Hi. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Isinger. I am at 137 Pine Street in North Amherst. I have a couple of points to make. I'm a member of the CPAC committee. Um, I, my training is in economic development. Formerly, I was in the real estate department at Mass Development. And I've previously been a lead accredited professional. So I look at this project with a lot of um, interest. And I've been a resident of Amherst for 10, uh, eight years, excuse me. Um, I, right, I'm speaking here to enthusiastically support the Jones Library um, from a number of different angles. Um, perhaps the most important role that I have though is as a mother to a young person in Amherst, a four-year-old. And we've used the library as an asset and a resource and a vital uh, part of our lives um, in her young years. And every time we go, we are among the only English speakers. Um, we're often um, among a varied and diverse group of an immigrant population there. And I know from my work um, here in Massachusetts and more broadly that libraries represent really a town center. Um, it's a place for low income people to come to do job searches, for homeless people to have respite, uh, for people to have free resources, bathrooms, et cetera. And we just do not have a library that befits our town and befits the kind the town that we want to have and live in. So I'm a, I, I trust, so as someone mentioned earlier about the process and I wanted to say two things. One is that I really trust the professionals um, at the town. The town professionals have told us that we can afford the four capital projects. And I think we should trust that process. Further, I think we should trust the process of the board of directors and the staff of the Jones Library who've ably um, husbanded this project and stewarded the project all along with lots of public input, lots of opportunity for public input. So I'm just here to enthusiastically support the, the, the project and hope that the town council votes to support it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Tom Lardner, please enter the room, state your name, where you live. Athena, are we able to bring Tom in? Yes, I'm in. <laughs> I say Angie Lardner, I'll speak for Tom too. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> 175 Amity Street. We're down the block from the library. We love it. We use it all the time. We've been here 40 years. And while Tom was involved in some earlier changes, it's time, it's time for the library to, uh, gosh, all this technology. It's time for the library to take advantage of this. And I strongly support it. We both do. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Tom and Jean, for joining us. Erica Zikos, state your name and where you live. Me, uh, my name is Erica Zikos, and I live on Hulst Road in Amherst. Um, and I too am here to enthusiastically support the renovation in addition to the Jones Library. Um, I just also want to acknowledge how hard people have been working on this project for so long, and I think it's high time that we move forward. Um, I think that opting out of state funding for the library merely leaves us with the same bill for a far inferior product. And um, I've listened to Mr. Bockelman um, in his various presentations describe that, you know, we have been uh, saving and paying down debts and that we can afford this project um, and the others. So it's not an either or question for our town. Um, you know, the Jones is beloved, but unfortunately it's housed in a building that doesn't serve our changing community all that well anymore. Um, it leaks uh, heat and water. It has inaccessible spaces. It's not equipped for 21st century programming. Um, the children's room is split across four rooms on two floors. Our teenagers have no space to gather. There aren't enough computers. That Woodbury room is too small. English language lessons often take place in the cold vestibule area. Staff are wedged into two small spaces. Um, you know, what's proposed to be demolished is the 1990s edition, not the historic structure um, and its wings. And so we can keep that historic structure, 
make it accessible to everyone, remove the part that isn't working and build back better in this time with a century in mind and not just 25 years. I, I think we should keep in mind that true sustainability is defined, yes, by environmental health, uh, but also by economic and civic well-being. And in light of all that this pandemic has revealed with regards to inequities in our community, I feel that we really need to be thinking about community sustainability in more complex terms. A library that is energy efficient, welcoming to residents of all ages, race and ethnic backgrounds and economic means makes perfect sense to me. So I hope that you'll support the library renovation. Thank you for your comments, Erica. Johanna, did you have another comment or did you just leave your hand up? I'm going to... Sorry, I my hand was still up accidentally. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Sarah, is your hand up to make another comment or do you need to just take it down? Okay, uh, Kristen Worges. Hello, Kristen Warjos, 680 Bay Road. Um, been a Amherst resident for the last eight years. We are the parents of three boys, one at the high school, one at the middle school, and one at the elementary school. I also work at Wildwood Elementary School and faced the devastating news four years ago when we refused the state funding to replace our desperate school, there are schools that are desperate in desperate need of repair. Um, I'm here to enthusiastically beg you to please support this project. We are losing young families from this town. I think we have a lot of young families who can and are willing to pay high taxes, but are extremely frustrated at the infrastructure in our town that is run down, our schools are run down, our roads are run down, our library, which should be a hub for our children, um, quite frankly, isn't a very welcoming place. Um, and our family has a longstanding tradition of going to libraries when we're on vacation. We, we used to go every single Friday before we moved here. And since moving here, we really um, were so disheartened at the condition of our library. Our children are extremely excited at the net zero um, prospect of having a state of the art library in our town. Um, so I just thank you all for your service. I thank you for your consideration. I am hopeful by all um, hearing everything that the community is saying. Um, and I hope that we can move forward with this project as well as the other capital projects that need to be done in our town. Thank you. Kristen, thank you for your comments. Lydia Vernon Jones, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Lydia Vernon Jones. I live on Gaylord Street in Amherst. And I have spoken to this at a previous forum, but in listening in tonight, I'm very dismayed that we're talking about major capital projects that have not been, the thing that hasn't been included in the major capital projects is the retrofitting and the renovation of the buildings that we already own. I think this is premature to be voting this money before you have received the report uh, from the uh, Energy and Climate Change Committee you have not looked at the budget that's going to be needed in the next 20 years to meet those goals. And it's gonna be bigger than any of these major capital projects. And I think this is premature. I'm sorry if the money has to be grabbed from the state right now, but uh, it doesn't make sense to me. That's all I have to say. Lydia, thank you for your comment. Mara Loft, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Have I entered the room? You have. I have, okay. Hi, I'm Mara Loft. I live at 22 Ward Street in Amherst. I've lived here since 1980. Um, I'm a timid public speaker, so excuse me if I stumble. Um, this is a complicated project. I love the Jones Library. It's probably my favorite thing about Amherst. Uh, I use it all the time and the librarians are terrific and all the services are great. I see that the library needs expansion, um, but I'm at 
dismayed at the cost of this. I do not like the plans. I'm a graphic designer and artist. And um, sorry to the architects, but it looks kind of like the front of the building on steroids. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's friendly looking. I don't like the big ring at the other end of town. Um, and I think the process from what I'm hearing is not what it ought to be, including that uh, saying that the, the users of the library are 51,000, including students who have their own libraries. I think that was a manipulation of statistics that um, makes me uncomfortable. Um, I love that it's a green building and sustainable. Um, I love that you know, you're thinking about, I, I was a volunteer uh, ESL teacher for some years, um, never had any problem meeting in the library um, or other spaces. So, you know, it, and community spaces, I, I think all of that is good, um, but I think it's too big and I don't think it's well thought out and I think it's being pushed from the top down. So I, I don't think I have a snowball's chance in hell of altering this process, which is well along the way. Um, but I just feel I have to say that. I wish there was some way that the, the state funds could be taken advantage of, but in a more thoughtful way. And I, I know the trustees really think that they have done this, but I don't agree with it. And I'll probably use the library in whatever fashion it's made because I love it, but I don't, I don't think this is good. So thank you. Laura, thanks for your comment. Laura Drucker, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Laura Drucker. I live at 57 Rosemary in District 2. Um, I have a lot of reasons why I think you all should vote yes tonight, um, but I'm speaking tonight specifically about climate action. Um, I spent 14 years working on climate change. I'm currently the chair of the Climate and Energy and Climate Action Committee, although I'm speaking today as an individual. Burning fossil fuels to create energy is the main cause of climate change and pollution that severely impacts human health and our environment. In Massachusetts, a third of our energy-related climate change causing emissions are due to burning fossil fuels and mainly natural gas in buildings. In fact, Massachusetts is one of 10 states that accounts for more than 50% of climate emissions from building nation, buildings nationwide. If we're gonna be successful in reducing our contributions to climate change, we need to work quickly and efficiently to get fossil fuels out of our buildings. And this will not be easy. So with all due respect to the often quoted, the most sustainable building is the one that already exists. This is simply not true when we're talking about a building that relies on fossil fuels. Our town libraries account for nearly 20% of natural gas used by our municipal buildings. This is natural gas that not only emits carbon pollution in our town when used, but that leaks even more potent methane emissions as it's piped across the country. Natural gas extraction has ruined water supplies, landscapes, and lives. The good news is that if by voting yes to get this state funding, we will allow us to move the library away from natural gas. Not only that, but this funding will allow us to create a library more conductive to public use with better temperature control, healthier air, and improved plumbing. Furthermore, we will be able to create a library that will finally be accessible and functional for a larger portion of our community. I truly believe this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the town to address so many important things at once. I've lived in Amherst for more than six years and I've heard about this library building since then, so I feel it. I disagree with the folks saying that this is moving too quickly. Um, just moving away from natural gas is a huge climate win in my book. But in addition to getting rid of fossil fuels and significantly reducing the energy use of the building, even with its larger size, the design of this building also considers the climate impact of the building materials and construction that Ta Todd and Sarah spoke about earlier and Chris. This is in recognition of the fact that new materials do have an environmental impact and we may need to make sure that the new design has a lower climate footprint than the current library and it will. Could this design go further in addressing climate concerns? Sure, and this is true of any design aiming to address many problems. Perhaps the current design could save more energy with a different approach to daylighting or maybe some of the operational savings due to the more efficient building 
could be reserved to fund other climate action in town. These are things that can be discussed and debated after voting yes. Do not throw away this opportunity by letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Laura. Mara, I believe your hand is still up from before. And Laura, you just put your hand back up. So we have 117 people attending tonight. And at this point, I do not see any additional new comments. Uh, we have one more, Jeff Lee, please enter the room and state your name, where you live. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee from District 5. Uh, and I'm troubled by what I think is an unprecedented move by the library trustees to spend 10, tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars to hire a marketing firm to promote the library expansion project. And I wonder how many positive comments to the town council may have been generated by this firm's efforts. This strikes me as undemocratic and unfair to the citizens who have legitimate objections to the library expansion proposal. And I feel that whatever, if any, borrowing may be decided upon for a library expansion should be financed by a debt exclusion override vote, as this would provide a truer gauge of the townwide popularity of the plan and would lower the amount of future borrowing that would be need to be raised by an override for the, an upcoming elementary school project. Um, thank you very much. Jeff, thanks for your comment. David Lithgow, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Athena, are you able to bring him in? Yes, I sent a request to unmute. Here we are. Thank you. Thank Can you, you hear me now? Yes. I inadvertently closed the uh, window. Uh, my That's name right. is uh, David Lithgow. I'm 80 years old. I moved here with my wife in 1977, and we raised three boys here. Age, uh, I've listened to the now I've listened to the comments on both sides, and I've been following the debate in the paper, and I've been listening to the experts. All I want to say at this point is that uh, I am deeply, profoundly grateful to those in 1928 that had the vision to build this library in the first place. And on behalf of, and I want to thank the council and all the experts that have put in God knows how many hours on this, thinking about this project. But I also want to thank you on behalf of those 50 years from now who will look back with the same deep, profound sense of gratitude that I have thanking you for voting for this project, as I'm sure you will. Thank you. David, thank you for your comment. Are there any other comments at this time? Carol, you've already spoken. Uh, I need to ask if there's anything additional that you feel you need to say. I would like to add a new fact, if I may. Sure. Um, Two, two things. One is that if we're prioritizing dealing with climate change, we should look at the North Amherst Library because that is on oil. And you could dig one or two geothermal wells and eliminate the oil, which is worse than the gas use. Um, I also think if we were going to spend 20 million to rehab the town to benefit climate change, there are other ways that we could do that. Um, in terms of whether the town can afford four projects, I don't think that's true because the town's planning to do an override. So um, I agree very much with let the people decide which things they want to do an override for. There, there could be, um, there should be a polling of the town. And uh, as for the elementary schools, um, there could be two elementary school projects, one of which starts immediately. And many of us who voted against the mega school wanted to see two neighborhood elementary schools be rebuilt as soon as possible. And that's where we should be putting our money, not on this project. But again, don't have the override be for the project that you know has support. Put it toward, have, have the override question be about whether or not this project has the support. Because uh, I think that in, absent any kind of effort to get a pulse on the town, no survey whatsoever done by townwide by an independent company. It's really negligent to proceed with this project costing 20 million and then go back to voters and say, please give us more money for the schools. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Carol. 
Emory Berger. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Um, hi, um, I'm Emory Berger. I live on Woodlot Road in District 5. Um, and uh, like, I, I, yeah, I've been here uh, almost 20 years. I'm a professor at UMass. Um, uh, both of my kids have gone through all of their schooling here, including Amherst Public Schools and UMass. Um, one almost out the door at UMass, and the other one has graduated recently. Um, I just wanted to, um, to add my voice in strong, enthusiastic support of this plan. Um, I've attended uh, previous meetings. I've been super impressed by the thoughtfulness uh, and the care that has been uh, involved in the, the development of this proposal. I want to thank everybody for all their hard work um, on behalf of the citizens spammers. Um, I'm, we're truly privileged uh, to have you all um, devoting your, uh, your hard work on, uh, on our behalf. And again, I, I really look forward to um, the, the council approving this uh, and uh, I think it'll be just an absolute jewel for, uh, for this town. Thank you so much. Emory, thank you for your comments. So it's 727 and we have a regular council meeting still to go through. And so with that, I am going to uh, adjourn the public forum and we're going to move on to the regular council meeting. And I believe that Mike Morris is now with us based on the sunshine I see and uh, we'll be ready to move on with the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Sure, um, would you like us to roll straight into it? Um, no. Hold on, Mike. Oh, I didn't think so. I just, I didn't know what that cue or that pause was. So I just was making sure it wasn't for me. I appreciate your eagerness, but I have to start the other meeting and get through just a couple more things. Okay. So we've already taken roll. And as far as I know, nobody has had any technical difficulties. So given that we have a quorum of the council, I am going to call the uh, April 5th. 2021 council meeting to order at 728. Uh, I've already mentioned that we are have audio, video, and uh, we it's live on Amherst Media. If you have trouble, please let us know. Uh, and without further ado, we're going to show the announcements. And while we're doing that, I just want to mention one item. And that is uh, on the announcement tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and in front of town hall, there will be a flag raising ceremony for child abuse awareness and prevention month. Uh, and this is a resolution that was sponsored by the town council and Marlene Musanti. We're going to go from that to the hearings. And so let me just start by uh, asking Andy Steinberg to call the finance committee to order. Yes, the finance committee um, is, uh, I believe, present fully, including three members of the uh, committee who are resident members, not councilor members. And uh, they have not acknowledged that they can participate. I don't know if you want me to do that, Lynn. Please do that. Three of them, or we. Um, so I, yes, uh, Bernie Kubiak. Um, can you hear, hear and? Uh, I'm and present, and I can acknowledge your presence. I'm present, and I can hear and the uh, Bob proceed. Hegner. Thank you. I'm here. And Jane Scheffler. I'm here. Jane? Okay, so we have um, all of the members of the committee present. I call this meeting of the Finance Committee to order. Uh, Lynn, back to you. Thank you. The reason we're doing that is because according to the charter, this is one of those times when the Finance Committee has to hold a public hearing. And the subject of the public hearing is in fact the regional school budget. And so uh, we're going to start this evening and welcome our four guests. They are Allison McDonald, Chair of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, 
Margaret Stancer, Vice Chair of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, Dr. Mike Morris, Superintendent, and Dr. Doug Slaughter, Director of Finance and Operations. And I believe at this point, I'm turning it over to Allison. Thank you. Um, and thanks for having us here to um, share the budget with you all um, this evening. I know it's been in your packets and um, so, uh, but in case you haven't had a chance to review it all, um, we'll, we'll take you through. I'm going to begin um, tonight giving an overview, um, provide some context for the budget, as well as a high level overview. And then um, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slato will take it over from there to go into um, more of the details of the budget and the assessment. Um, next slide. Uh, actually, you can go down to the next slide. Thanks. Um, our mission uh, is to provide our students with high quality education to enable them to be com contributing members of society. We seek to create an environment that achieves equity for all of our students and ensures that each student is a successful learner, is respected, and learns to respect each other. Slide four, next. We have strong leadership in our district, a diverse team of leaders with decades of experience, including Dr. Morris, who has the strong support of the Regional School Committee and with whom we recently signed a contract extension. Next slide. Our schools enjoy a strong reputation for our programs. On this slide, this is um, outtakes from the niche.com review of our high school. Um, all of our schools in our district are, are reviewed on that website. Our, our reputation is strong for programs, students, and teachers, and we repeatedly hear people say that they moved here or are planning to move here for our schools. Next slide. In terms of our students, many of our students are considered high needs as defined by the state Department of, of Elementary and Secondary Education. In the last five years, we've seen growth in the numbers of students in our district who are economically disadvantaged, have disabilities, or are English language learners. And a note, over 50 different languages, it might even be more than that, are spoken by students and families in our district. Next slide. Our student population is becoming more diverse, and the number of students who identify as Latino, Hispanic, or African American and Black is increasing. Next slide. Thanks to major recruitment and retention efforts, the numbers of BIPOC staff working in our district also is increasing. Next slide. Our high school offers a rich academic program that offers a diversity of courses and significant levels of choice for students to find and pursue their unique learning passions. Two thirds of 11th and 12th graders are taking advanced courses and three quarters of all students take courses in the arts, including studio art and multiple music ensembles. And this slide includes some outtakes from recent performances, um, as well as art show. And the students there is the uh, JETS team, which is a um, engineering mathematics competi national competition, of which I think in most years we've, um, our teams have ranked number one in the state. Next slide. These are some of our key goals and initiatives right now. We'll be um, shifting to a later start time in the fall at our middle school and high school, essentially continuing our current pandemic era start times as extensive research shows that this can have tremendous positive impact on learning outcomes and overall student wellness. We continue to support restorative justice practices and the implementation of anti-racism curriculum. We continue to focus on increasing teacher and staff diversity. And we're looking to engage the community later this spring and summer to inform a decision around expanding the middle school to include the sixth grade. Next slide. For the, current, for the upcoming fiscal year, the budget we're presenting of $31.9 million represents a $1.2 million cut to level services, a reduction that is on top of $800,000 in cuts to level services that we made for the current budget year. Before I turn it over to Dr. Morris, Dr. Slaughter to take you through some of these details, I'll share with you an overview of what we are funding in this budget. Next slide. 
At a super high level, as it's often stated, um, more than three quarters of our budget goes towards personnel, about half of which is for teaching staff in both regular and special education. Personnel related insurance and benefits represent one fifth of the total budget and nearly one third of our total personnel related budget. Gross expenditures for charter tuition represent 6% of our total budget, an amount that's not fully reimbursed by the state, which I'll come back to in a couple slides. Next slide. Digging a little deeper, looking at regular instruction, about $7 million of our total budget goes to personnel and expenses related to regular instruction. The, uh, the donut graph on the right um, is showing our current budget year. Um, because we until until this budget uh, for 22 is finalized, uh, we don't know the, the exact details, but it doesn't shift dramatically year over year. Um, but this donut is showing that most of this uh, reg spending for regular instruction is going towards our core academics in world language, which we also consider core academics. Next slide. About $6.8 million of our budget supports special education. And this budget shifts up and down in dire direct relation to the individualized needs of our students in special education. Most of our special ed budget goes toward education instruction and district programs, which includes contracted services and out of district expenses. Next slide. Our budget for student programs and support services is fairly steady at $2.3 million. 40% of which supports guidance services. Next slide. We've talked a lot um, and many of you are aware that um, enrollment in our district has been declining for several years. And our current school year decline of 4.7% is the steepest one year decline ever. Declining enrollment drives a reduction in our state aid or chapter 70 fund and some drivers some drivers of the decline, namely the charter school tuition and choice also contribute additional costs, not all of which is reimbursed by the state. Next slide. This chart shows the net cost to our district for charter schools after state reimbursement. Showing um, enrollment of, uh, sorry, the net district cost since um, fiscal year 11, 2011 to the projected year. In that time period, our charter enrollment has grown 47% and our net cost has grown 179% in that same time period. This is because the state reimburses only about 10% on average of the tuition for charter schools over the last five years. The per pupil cost is not saved when a student leaves because public schools are an economy of scale. And next slide. Oh, and this is where I'll turn it over um, to Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter to take us through these details. Sure, I'll, uh, um, I'll describe a little bit and maybe taking a step back before we go forward, but thank you, Chair McDonald, for that, um, that really helpful um, context that we, we enter the nitty gritty of the budget with. So just for people who, just to bring everyone back up to speed, so our regional schools are not part of the municipal budget in the same way the elementary school is. Regional schools are uh, the best way to think of them perhaps as, as a non-for-profit uh, organization um, that we have to keep E&D, so excess and deficiency, which is reserves, uh, much like the town of Amherst does, the regional schools have to do that. They have um, costs that uh, in, in municipal districts uh, go lots of different directions at the regional level. They stay with the region and regional districts in Massachusetts state law are formed when multiple, multiple towns uh, come together because I think there's a benefit to educating students within a regional context. In our region, there's four towns, Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury, and it's been that way for quite some time, um, since I believe the 50s, uh, 1950s. And, um, you know, I think that has... Um, wax and waned in terms of some challenges that have come up over those that long time period, particularly as it relates to assessment method. Uh, but just want to uh, note that because the, the purple bar you see there is total assessment. That's a really different uh, terminology than what you would use see for the Amherst Elementary School budget or the library budget or the police or the fire, uh, because it's an assessment um, that is uh, assessed to the member towns um, that forms, a, a, as you see, a healthy part of our budget. I think it's also 
worth noting that the town share of funding the budget has increased while the state share is essentially flat. And if we, if we uh, took this out to the last 20 years, you'd see that there's been a significant shift um, that the towns have had to carry more of the load, shoulder more of that financial burden than the state. And that's not true in our, just in our community, that's true in every community in the Commonwealth. Um, so it is a real challenge and we try to balance uh, the needs of students, the needs of providing the high quality education our, our town does uh, demand uh, with the fiscal realities that come with being part of a regional school system. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Doug if he wants to say anything else about this particular slide, but I just wanted to make sure everyone was uh, on solid footing in terms of what a regional school district is and why this is operating at a different time frame than the other parts of the town budget. Doug, anything else you wanna share on this particular slide? It helps if I unmute myself, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I would point out, and we'll see this in more detail on subsequent slides, where you see that lower state uh, transportation reimbursement and ED for budget support. Um, you know, those are both sources of, of money that we utilize to help uh, support our budgets. Um, the rationale behind the, the transportation reimbursement being less is we had less transportation costs. And uh, those are held separate in, in regional school districts and reimbursed by the state uh, uh, separately. Than, than the sort of chapter 70A. Um, and then the E&D is about how our, uh, you know, we, res it, in paralleling what is called uh, town reserves or, or uh, free cash in the, uh, in the town uh, budget, E&D is the same type of thing. We have some limits on how much of that we can carry year to year. Um, we're utilizing less this year. It's partly a cash flow uh, circumstance relative to the, uh, to the pandemic and, and how things have played out over the last year. So uh, we'll get into a little more detail in the subsequent slide, but those are a couple of things I wanna mention there. Yeah, so as Athena transitioned us, I think the key point also is the total assessment increase being requested this year is 1.5%. That's of all the member towns combined. That's not of the town of Amherst, and we'll get into the details on that in a second, but I think we can transition to the next slide. We're also conscious you have a, a healthy agenda uh, and uh, so we're trying to be uh, rather brief, but we'll open up for questions in a couple minutes. So um, I think I can try to start with this one, Dr. Slaughter. So what we are recommending and what was voted by the school committee is the 65% statutory method. Uh, it's a method that mixes the statutory or state defined method. It is the state default method if the towns cannot come to agreement uh, with uh, the five-year rolling average, which is in the regional agreement. Uh, to be short, it tries to mix uh, the enrollment changes uh, with uh, some, some ability to pay aspects. And that's really where the statutory uh, language comes through. It is an increase. Uh, in, in past years, we started at 30, then, you know, 40. And, uh, you know, so 65 is a jump, uh, you know, and I think for those of you who've been at four town meetings, you know that it's a balancing act that we have to play with towns with uh, different conceptions of what fairness is. Uh, but we feel like, you know, I'll just say I'll feel like uh, bluntly, this is the method that has the best chance of passing all four towns. Um, and so we stayed within the guidance of the town of Amherst, which is a 2.1% increase towards the bottom of this slide. You can see that it's there's significant variance between the four towns uh, about the difference between what's uh, being assessed this year and what the proposal has. And again, that gets into this uh, sticky business of assessment methods and you know relatively small changes of enrollment like Pelham is ex in experiencing. Uh, for next year means a significant increase in their assessment. Um, and, and it really is a, a significant challenge for all of us at the regional level uh, to manage this. I think this is five or six years in a row that we have not had the same assessment method. Uh, and it's really trying to balance the needs and interests of the communities that, that send our students, send us students to be able to do that. Um, Doug, anything you wanna add on this slide, knowing that we're trying to be uh, short on time so that there's, if there's questions we can, you be a little more expansive from the council? Not at this time. Okay, I think then we can transition to the next slide. Okay. Um, actually, I'm gonna turn this one all to you, Doug. Um, this okay. gets nitty gritty beyond my level of detail. So I'm gonna turn Perfect. it to you. Well, I'll be brief on this because a large degree of this has been shown in previous slides in, in more colorful uh, donut type charts, uh, which, which uh, Make me a little hungry relative to uh, the fact that it's dinner time. But um, but what you're seeing here are the actual numbers that go and back up those 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 uh, donut style charts on the previous slides. But but what you'll see is that the total uh, of salaries is the is the largest part of our budget. 
um, and it has the biggest driver, uh, it is the biggest driver of change in our budget is, is our negotiated salaries and steps that we have with our, with our uh, employees. Uh, all of our contracts are due for, for negotiation. Uh, they all end on June 30th, 2021. And so we made estimates about what those types of uh, cost of living increases might look like um, and put that into our, our factors here, as well as uh, a step increases for those that are not at the top step of the salary schedule. Um, additionally, what you'll notice is there's a 3% overall, uh, barring any changes, any ads or reductions in our budget, uh, the expectation sort of from the current year to next year would be about a 3% increase in our budget. Uh, however, to meet the, the ability of the four towns to, to uh, meet the assessment that's, that's uh, you know, necessary, we're going to reduce our budget by $1.2 million to do that. Some of that is uh, a result of some one-time savings. So, uh, and, and some of it is a, is a, it are actual reductions in services that we provide. And, and some of that's based on uh, decline in number of students, but some of that's also based in uh, real reductions and things we offer. Um, and we'll, uh, I believe in the in subsequent slide, we'll be able to get into that in a little more detail. But, but what you do notice here is, is that, uh, like I said before, you know, peop we're in a people business, much like the town is. And so when, when our uh, staffing costs uh, change uh, significantly, that influences our budget in a pretty profound way. And so it's the driver of most of our, our increases from one year to the next. Um, so I think we're ready for the next slide. And so in order to reach that, that uh, $1.2 million in, in reduction, uh, you know, we made a number of changes. And so the, the items at the top here are, are typically one year savings, things that are, are uh, kind of one and done, uh, sort of one time money as it were. Um, we have a, you know, for example, a health insurance premium holiday that's coming up and, and that will save us uh, about $300,000 or so, a little more than that. Um, we have some, some uh, reduction in our need for, for uh, uh, devices from uh, technological devices because we've been allowed to and, and purchase a number of items through uh, uh, CARES Act money to support our students and have them be in, in able to be in remote uh, classroom settings. Uh, there's some other savings in that regard. Similarly, you know, with turnover in staff, uh, retirees and new hires tend to have a difference in price. Um, some shifting of, of some costs from, from one district to another, those all help to support our budget in sort of a one-time way. But the, the nitty gritty of, of, of the changes we had to make were largely in that lower section where we have budget reductions. The items with lines through them are ones that we had considered, but then subsequently did not need to, uh, to enact in, in order to get to that 1.2 million uh, in, in reductions you see. Um, and then, uh, the remainder of those are, are reductions that we were trying to execute in such a way as to impact students as least as possible, uh, try to keep the, uh, the reductions as far from the students and their services as we could as we went through and, and tried to make our budget uh, work out relative to the uh, support we have. Uh, Dr. Morris, did you have anything you wanted to add to that slide? No, I think we're running uh, right up against our window. So I think if there's questions about any of the specific uh, things on their uh, proposed reductions or voted reductions, then uh, I certainly can answer them within the context of the Q&A. And so I uh, just, um, these are just some links. Um, to you know, data, the program of studies, which you know, if there's one thing on here, I know it's a budget hearing, uh, but the program of studies is really worth looking at because I think it really shows the breadth of offerings at our high school and how unique it is uh, in terms of the elective programs and all the different ways that students can find their passion, their academic passion, and then other, uh, other courses, other uh, systems they want to study. It's not the high school. I love my high school. It was a good high school, different state, uh, but we, by the time you were a senior, you started taking electives. That's not the case at Amherst Regional High School. We really value uh, and want students to explore different areas of study. And I think it's worth taking a look at that link. And I think if you forward, there's some benchmark data uh, from other districts, but um, you know, we certainly, I don't think we'll go through that necessarily. It's more for people um, to be able to take a look at. And I think at this point, unless Ms. Stancer or McDonald have anything they'd like to add, we can end our presentation and open up for any questions the council may have. Okay, so let me just explain the process from here on. We're actually going to run this like we do a regular hearing. Uh, and uh, that will start with questions from the council and then clarifying questions from the public. 
And then we ask those from the public who would like to speak in favor of the proposed budget, those who would like to speak in opposition come next. And then finally, we return to questions from the council. Two other things I wanna point out. The reason we take this budget off cycle is because the other three partners in our regional school district are towns and their budgets come before their town meeting uh, in a manner that means we need to act on this before we begin acting on our total town budget. Uh, the second thing that I wanna just point out is that later on in the agenda, on the consent agenda, we will refer this to the finance committee and the finance committee then will take it up in detail at their meeting or meetings over the next two, over the next two meetings. So with that, are there questions from counselors? Dorothy Pam, please unmute and ask your question. Um, is it correct that you have a cut in uh, arts and technology in this budget? There is no cut to technology. The reduction to technology was based on devices. We don't need to purchase as many Chromebooks because of we, you know, thanks to the support of the federal government as well as the town of Amherst and Paul for partnering with us on that, we purchased those devices. So when we talk about a cut in technology, it's because we don't have the devices that we don't need to purchase devices we need. There is a reduction in art um, at our middle school. Um, we were, you know, blessed to have two art teachers for a 400 person school. Um, that is a uh, frankly, a bit out of uh, inconsistent with partner schools or even our elementary schools, which have one art teacher for the same number of students. Um, so again, as we're looking at declining enrollment, we do have to look at where cuts may be uh, able to be realized um, that still offer a high quality education uh, for our students. And in this case, with declining enrollment, uh, when we look at partner districts, when we look at other uh, schools within our district, we wanted to align the percentages to be um, accurate for the number of students. I, I would like to offer an opinion on this. Uh, we're recovering uh, for many children a terrible year of not having in-person school. And I think anything that involves using their hands, um, manipulating materials, um, problem solving, anything that allows them to develop their sense of self-efficacy and of saying, yes, I can do it, even if it's out of line with other schools. I, I just think there's a huge need now. And if there's any way to restore that money to the art, I, art program, I would really recommend it highly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Mandy Jo, your comment? I have a number of questions. I don't sit on the finance committee, so I'm gonna try and ask a bunch of them tonight. Um, send some to Andy tomorrow, because I, I know we have a busy agenda, um, but I apologize for asking so many. I'm going to stick to one thing right now, which is the definition of level services. Um, what I'd like to know what the definition of level services is that you use, because that is a definition that when you give a number, you then talk about the cuts to that. Um, and I asked this question, and, and then how do you calculate that quote number of level services? I ask this because when I look at the quote cut sheet on page 48, um, health insurance premium holiday is a reduction on, under the cut sheet. It's listed as a budget reduction, um, but it is part of that. It I assume it was included in a level services number and then you're taking a number down, but it's not a decrease in services. It's a savings, whether it's a year or two, it's not something that I don't think personally should have been listed in a level services number. Uh, many of those um, budget, budget adjustment sections are things that aren't cuts to services. Um, and so, you know, then the next question I have is regarding the payroll numbers um, with level services. When Sorry, you say can I interrupt? Because I, say, I noticed that you had a number of questions. It might be um, useful because I think if you have a number of them, invariably those of us answering them will lose track of the questions if there's a number. So uh, with, with your permission and, and you know, the president's, it'd be okay to maybe go one by one because I think otherwise we may give less satisfactory answers just because of our cognitive load. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Slaughter who can speak to how, we, how he comes up with the level service um, number. Sure. So, so what we do as far as level services is we look at, at what our current status is at the time that we start forming our budget, which is in you know, essentially late October, November. Um, 
that may differ from what our budget was uh, because the needs of the students that are in the school at that time are are likely different. So, you know, our special education costs and staffing related to that, or our regular education staffing may be slightly different. So if you were trying to compare level services to what we ended up budgeting at the end of, of a budget cycle, they're gonna be a little different from that. Um, I certainly, you know, understand the the, the concept of, of the budget adjustments that we have and that those are from a level services uh, budget. We're deducting those things. Uh, they're not the same. I mean, there's still a cut if they didn't exist. I mean, they're quite frankly, to my opinion, a, 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 uh, a fortunate opportunity to not slice more from our budget. But at the same time, if they didn't exist or they don't get realized, uh, they will result in other things being taken or, or you know, being needed to uh, be removed in order to support our budget. So, uh, you know, it's sort of in lieu of something else. Um, you know, it is in some ways definitionally a little tricky. Uh, and maybe a bit nuanced um, to, to say that, but I, I, that, that is why we try to capture them separately from the rest of those. Uh, but at the same time, they are their one-time reductions. Uh, so if they didn't exist, we would be making other more drastic uh, cuts to actual programs and services that, that seem more in, the, in align with the, the, the definition of a, a cut or reduction. But at the same time, they're there are uh, cost avoidance in some circumstances, not always. Okay, it, it just seems like they're not actual cuts to level services, yet they are presented that way in the budget, um, at least the way I look at it. Um, similarly, I guess one of my questions with the payroll issues is if a grade goes from 10 classes to nine classes and therefore requires one less educator, would that be listed as a cut to level services or is that reduction due to enrollment declines part already a represented as a lower level services number? Again, I'm trying to get to the definition of level services because a lot of people say we're cutting so much yet I look at the quote cuts and reductions and much of it does not actually look like cuts to services. Um, and then one, one other question on this one and then I'll give someone else a, a a chance. Um, the level services number actually between the March 9th budget and the March 23rd budget increased by $104,000 after it had stayed the same since February 2nd. When I dug down into where that increase was, it was in the regular education payroll line, specifically to the math teacher payroll line in the high school and middle school. But the FTE numbers for the math department didn't change between the two budgets. So what happened to actually increase the level services number between March 9th and March 23rd when no employee increases were listed in the budget? Right. So, so I'll, I'll take, the, oh, Doug, do you want to take the second one? Because I can do the first part of that question. Sure. So I'll take the second part because it's it's fairly straightforward. It's, it's again, I think uh, traditionally the way in which we've uh, utilized school choice money, the lion's share of the school choice money that we apply, we apply to the mathematics department and in particular to the, uh, you know, the regular education staffing. And so when we uh, were made aware um, the day of the meeting with the regional school committee that there would be $104,000 roughly that would be available to us uh, that wasn't available to us previously, uh, we talked about ways in which we could incorporate that into the budget. And what we did was we utilized less school choice than what we were previously planning. Um, it's difficult. I, I went back and forth about how to present that. Um, it is in those lines, uh, to be perfectly honest, the actual cost of the staff in those budget lines is much, much higher because we use, um, you know, between 500 and $700,000 in any given year to support, um, you know, our, our services uh, that we provide through school choice monies. And so if you'll notice those department relative to other similar size departments like English, uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the salary lines are decidedly lower relatively, uh, relative to those as well. And so it's really a shift in, in, in utilizing less school choice to preserve that money for a subsequent uh, purpose. Um, and so it is difficult to display. I, I perhaps could have put it onto our ads and cuts. It would have been in the section at the top under, under changes to budget, you know, to budget additions and reductions. Um, so it would have been similarly, you know, uh, confusing, I guess. Uh, I ne haven't necessarily found the best way to present that kind of a late breaking change to, to, uh, to those costs. And so we're, we're leveraging less of our school choice uh, reserves to support our budget. So our, our uh, 
general fund supported uh, salaries are higher as a result of that. And the first part of your question, um, I, I fear it's not going to be satisfying, but it is the answer that I that I believe in and will give is, you know, what's a level service, what's a cut based on enrollment and what's a cut based, a decline in enrollment, what's a base that's a decline in services. I don't think it's a, it's a neat definition, right? I don't think like I'll, I'll use the, the, there was a comment by a counselor before you about art, right? So one could easily say, well, we have declining enrollment. We've had declining enrollment a while. We're going to reduce art. Does that art reduction reduce the art, ex the number of art experiences available to students at the middle school next year per capita? The answer is yes, it definitely does. We're not reducing enrollment by that level. Uh, is there a reasonable argument to made? And I, to me, I think yes, because we, I made it, that I think we can realize this cut and still provide, you know, a high quality art experience for students in middle school. Yeah, I think that's there. So, you know, I, I think it's a good question. I want to be honest and transparent to say that. You know, one could argue a number of these cuts either way. Um, I think the elementary, it's a little cleaner. Where to use your example, you have 10 sections. Next year, you need nine sections. You can make that adjustment. Um, I'm thinking back to the elementary budget. We probably should have done that in the elementary budget and put the one reduction there and adjustments we have before. Um, but even that one, then you're increasing class size, right? You know, by definition, even if you're saying, well, we can, we can realize that cut, it still may have an impact on class size. So there's a lot of gray. And I think that's what makes school budgets particularly hard as you're dealing with, 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 with students and, and especially at the secondary level with complex schedules. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's good feedback for us. We appreciate that. And we always try to think about how can we present things really cleanly. But I, I don't think there's a chart that says enrollment driven reductions and non-enrollment non -enrollment driven reductions. I think those two, if you did a Venn diagram, there'd be an awful lot that's in the middle. Right, so we're trying to make intelligent decisions based on declining enrollment. Uh, but if we weren't making the reductions, would we have more opportunities for kids? You know, I'll use the art example. Absolutely, there's no denying that. Um, so that's, I think, where I struggle in communication and we, I'm happy to follow up offline. Any feedback that, that you or any counselor has on us in terms of how to communicate that, we'd be very open to. Thank you. Kathy Shane. Um, I have a couple questions, and if you don't have answers today, maybe when we meet again at the Finance Committee. Um, I, I wanted to just get a sense of um, the, the pay scales and step increases, and how much would the salary budget go up if there were no COLAs and it was just step increase? Um, so that's one question. You know, if you took the whole salary budget and people right. on, and then I could answer that one really quickly, again, unsatisfactorily. So I apologize that that will be my answer. But as we're in negotiations, that would not necessarily be advisable for us to be sharing um, publicly uh, because we do we did have to budget without contract increases that were agreed to and we're in negotiations. So we would not make public some more financial data like you're requesting uh, because uh, for a whole host of reasons, but one could also, one could claim that that's negotiating in public. Um, so. Um, we, I can't answer that question. I mean, there's other things we maybe could follow up offline and be able to share, but that's not something we can share in a public yeah. meeting at this point. Because yeah. the, next, the next we're going to be, you know, uh, get a sense of how many people have already topped out on the steps um, or what share. So I just had a, you know, how much um, when Doug said the contracts are all open, you know, and since they're I come from the union side years and years ago, but you know we're in an unusual time. Um, so I, I won't press you more on that. And it it goes with Mandy's overall question of, you know, if enrollment is declining and we're we've got tight budgets, at, but you've got full benefits and you're being paid. So I will not uh, I will not keep asking on that line. That'd be fine. So I think I think the second question you asked about what percentage of people are at top step, that's something I don't expect Doug to have for you right now, but that that's the, that would not be an issue to answer that question. So uh, Doug maybe could be able to, I don't think he knows it off the top of his head, but maybe we could bring that to the finance committee tomorrow. Okay. And, and then, um, and again, I don't need this right away, but do you regularly do um, salary comparisons both at the top administrative level and then at um, any other top to the local valley, you know, what other schools are paying. Is that regularly done in some way? Yeah, it's, that's part of the negotiation process. Um, 
the attorney for who represents the district routinely pulls those that data. And is it across the board? So it would be what what's principal paid? What's the next? Not just the people in the bargaining unit, but all the way up and down. Yeah, yeah. Typically, we we do it more less formally for the people who are non-unit because we do that with kind of superintendents in Hampshire, Franklin, and, and Hamden counties. Um, for the bargaining units, it's a little more formal because it's more formal to, you know, that's the nature of union bargaining. Okay, thank you. Um, Darcy Dumont. Hi, um, I had a, a request that I that I actually passed on to you, uh, Mike, from a, um, a high school student who was interested in, in finding out about um, whether through the whole community services working group process and you know related to other departments in town whether um whether some amherst police department funding for this year was uh, you know if there's any discussions about it being targeted um to uh, to other departments including the school department so i noticed that some of the reductions could conceivably be, you know, they could conceivably fall into the category of like the bilingual psychologist position and so on that um, that might be a place where funding could be moved from department to department. I just wondering, have there been any discussions about that or um, is that something that's even um, considered to be something that could be done during this upcoming budget. Um, and so I'm just throwing that out there as a, you know, like, have there be, been any discussions about that? Yeah, so um, two things. One, the bilingual psychologist position, I just want to clarify this, so I'm glad you brought it up. It's not that we're not having it. The, the, the position is to do evaluations for students um, who particularly have um, background in Spanish and English. And so we've had an open position for a while. It's not a direct service position. It's just for special education evaluations. And we haven't found anyone that has the qualification. So we'll continue contracting out uh, that situation. And there's some cost savings associated. So in terms of what positions, perhaps if uh, all of a sudden the world got better, um, that, that's not necessarily the top on my list, not because I don't value having full-time position, but we had it posted, we can't find the person. And we found a successful model that's more efficient moving forward. On the broader question you had, you know, where, I mean, not to flip it back to the council and to Paul, but um, I'm the superintendent of schools. Thankfully for everyone in the world, I'm not the superintendent of public works, right? Guilford does a good job. If I was superintendent of public works, you all would be dealing with many, many more complaints about public works than uh, uh, my technical limitations. And similarly, you know, I work, you know, closely with all the town departments. Um, but I think that's a conversation in terms of how the town prioritizes funding between departments that 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 I respectfully I would stay out of that's not sort of and as I see it my bailiwick that's for the council and for the town manager uh, to be involved in so you know for the student you know we did have some public comments maybe last month or the month before um, that was um, talking about use of town departments and we really encourage people and the, the chair did this I think really well um, so thank you Allison that if, if that's the conversation to have then actually your group is the group to have it, not so much the school committee, which has a more limited role than you all um, get to enjoy. Um, I'm going to uh, just raise a question because I am on the finance committee. So I have the privilege of getting to grow you even further in future meetings. Uh, but when you come to our meetings, would you please give us a sense of how your CARES money was spent and in way, particularly in ways that it has relieved your budget? and how you look to the new federal dollars and how you see them relieving your budget and or being used for extra things, okay? So it's not even a question now, it's to say, please come prepared to discuss that. Thank you. Mandy yeah. Jo? Yeah, thank you. Um, just two more things, one of which is not a question, it's a thank you. Um, I had questions about why the 65% assessment method was picked, um, and you did answer that during your presentation in terms of that's where the school committee and, and the superintendent and all believe there's the best chance of getting something that wouldn't force us to 
move to the state required law. Um, so thank you for answering that and explaining why that one was because I had questions about that based on four towns meetings. Um, my next question is, I think, probably more for the chair and vice chair of the regional school committee, particularly the chair. Um, the motions that the regional school committee voted said that they'll send, especially for the capital one, send the capital requests to the quote board of selectmen of the individual towns. Our home rule charter um, has been in effect for three years and it required our Amherst members of the regional school committee to seek modifications to bring the regional agreement into conformance with the charter. So my question is, um, we don't have a board of selectmen anymore. We're operating in a gray area with motions like that um, in terms of who gets to and all, and we've done okay with that. Um, but what progress has, if any, has been made on looking at our regional agreement to bring it in conformance with the town charter now? Um, and what is the anticipated timeline for doing so? Um, thanks for that. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Slaughter. I'll actually take that one because uh, I typically put that motion language together. And, and to some extent, it's a matter of of changing the wording of the motion, it's not really driven by what is in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, regional agreement per se. It's more a matter of getting the the language in the motion to uh, to the count, to the school committee uh, tidied up in that regard. I think that I might have gotten it accurate last year and then and then omitted it this year. It's an unfortunate oversight on my part, uh, but nonetheless, it's it's. I think the critical piece to know is that it is the requirement is that we send notification to the uh, you know the uh, appropriating committee uh, or you know so in a town with us you know it's the select board because they are then the persons that call town meetings and that's where they would actually take action on or if they choose to they don't actually have to take uh, take action on it so you can you know, sort of sit on it and it automatically gets approved uh, in in the circumstance with the council uh, you know we did send a uh, notification to the council through uh, through the treasurer of the regional schools. Um, and so the, the, the material effect is, is the same, uh, it going to the council for, for notification and action or, or inaction. Uh, if you don't take action on it, then it is uh, by de facto approved, but, but nonetheless, it, it was sent to the appropriate body. Uh, it's a matter of, uh, linguistics that we need to tidy up as far as the motion language and, and but as far as the material effect, as long as we get it to you, the appropriate, uh, governing body in each of the towns, then, then we've uh, we've met the requirement of law. I do think that Mandy Joe has raised another question, and that is the issue: at what point do we all need to take a look at the regional agreement and bring it in line with the town charter? And that's a whole different issue. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any more questions from counselors. We'll have a, an opportunity at the end. But I would I, like Allison to address my question about whether the Amherst members of the regional school committee have made any progress on modifying the regional agreement, and if not, what the timeline is for doing so. Um, we have not. Um, our focus um, immediately after, in the first year after the new town charter, was focused on our policies, which actually govern most of our um, operations on the on the regional school committee. So we did tackle and go through, I think, in in cooperation with um, uh, Paul and the and the town hall in terms of going through our policy handbook and identifying which things needed to be updated. Um, and we have have worked through those. We have not, as as Dr. Morris alluded to, gone back to the regional agreement, and that's a much bigger um, nut to crack, I'd say. Thank you for the update. Alyssa, question? Yeah, <clears throat> it is definitely a question. I really appreciate the way Mike responded to the we're always open to feedback um, answer as to how budgeting works. And I just want to put in another plug for things just being a little clearer explained in text when charts don't really do it. Um, even pretty donut charts can often not do everything you want them to do. And although I personally have kind of given up on this argument, having been part of it since 2002, I was reminded tonight of the argument that, you know, the math department costs from year to year, for example, just like the planning department costs from year to year on the town side, if you, if you push them up and down because of grants or because of use of school choice money, 
it looks like you've changed something. It looks like you have fewer FTE or more FTE, or it looks like the responsibilities have changed. When in all reality, it's just the funding source that's changed. And so I appreciate we do it the way we always do it. But then it's no surprise that it's really hard to explain to the average person looking at this on the street, much less to some of us when we're trying to compare apples to apples. So just think about, you know, if Munis makes you do it that way, you know, that's that's a pretty good refrain. But if there's a way that you can put some text in there that explains that to people that actually there is no change in this FTE, it's just that how we're paying for it is what's changing would be really helpful. So thank you for that. And I will say the same thing to Paul because we will get budgets that have the exact same concerns, just like we always did at town meeting, that it looked like the percentages varied widely and they really didn't. Are there any other comments from counselors before I go to public comments? And the first public comments I'm looking for are those that are in um, favor of the present school budget. And we don't seem to have any of those at this time. Then I'm going to ask for those people. You missed questions from the public, Lynn. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Mandy Jo. The first thing is, are there any clarifying questions from the public? Jose Lugo, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jose Lugo. I live at 52 Jeffrey Lane here in Amherst. And a clarifying question regarding the technology position in the previous uh, budget slideshow that was presented was shown that um, I'm going to excuse me jump in there that, that there was a um, cut to specials and technology was going to be reduced to four days a week at each school did I miss that in in um, your reply regarding the technology budget cuts yeah so uh, this is where our, our complicated governance gets uh, more complicated so uh, that's a reduction that was in the Amherst elementary school budget this tonight's presentation and discussion uh, only pertains to the regional school budget which is grades 7 through 12 so you are correct that there was a budget uh, reduction recommended and passed uh, relates to technology but it's for a different district okay thank My you apologies very much. for the confusion say that budget will come forward on May 1st when the town manager presents his budget for the full town. Okay. Are there other que clarifying questions from the public? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to then ask, are there any people from the public who would like to speak in favor of the budget? Okay, uh, then how about, he, how about people in the public who would, I'm sorry, Gabrielle Gould. Please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Hi, Gabrielle Gould, 34 Canton Avenue. Um, a, I, I just wanna start with thanking um, Mr. Slaughter, Mr. Morris, Ms. McDonald. Um, this is a ton of work. I can't even imagine trying to put all of these into a line item. I do just quickly want to state a voice of support for something that Dorothy Pam mentioned earlier, and that is for the arts. Um, as a mother of four, as two who have remained homeschooled or at home schooled for the last year, I, I cannot even begin to express what I think the ripples of the effects of this past year are going to be for the children and the students across the nation, across the world, but here in Amherst, arts, heal. Um, they, I, as a former artist, as someone who ran a theater for many, many years, I know the impact that they have. We chose to move here two and a half years ago for the high school. Um, and we are still, we stick by that. It was the best decision we made. Um, but part of it was that incredible arts program that you have, um, especially, you know, I think about Mr. Bechtold and all that he does that my son is enjoying currently as we speak. And again, I just want to put, you know, if there's any wiggle room on that, please consider it. And then to take this way back to the beginning of this meeting, if these are the cuts that need to be made to continue to move forward and to continue to give the best we can, 
that library is more important than it could ever have been in the past um, as we move forward for the future of our students and as arts deplete across the nation, libraries and their ability to move forward into 21st century are going to be very important to continue to bring the arts to our kids and to ourselves. Thank you all again for all the work you've done. Are there any other comments in favor of the budget? Are there any comments or public comments in opposition to the budget? We have one call in user. Uh, please enter the room, state your name and identify where you live. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this is Vincent O'Connor, um, 175 Summer Street in Amherst. And I would um, preface my, my comments by saying, you know, with regard to the fi financial of the budget that um, if maybe there are some people who were around at the time, but Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter School, and I'm not a supporter of charter schools and voted against them every time I could at the state level. But that charter school developed because of budget cuts uh, in a recession at late 80s, early 90s. And then I think the, uh, the Ch Chinese Immersion School unfortunately resulted from a um, an elementary school uh, uh, reception of those who pr propose that the, the immersion process take place within the Amherst schools. So that having been said, I'm, um, I, I've been constantly dismayed by the um, inability of the school committee to obtain from our, our two uh, institutions of higher learning uh, dedicated money, especially for the regional budget from Amherst College and from UMass. Um, they have an impact on the town, which is substantial and their contributions to the town directly to the town budget. All this other contribution doesn't mean anything when you come down to having to cut things out of the school budget. And we need cash and I am, I would just urge the the school committee members and the administration to uh, given that some of the federal money that's going to be available, we need a five year deal with Amherst College to contribute some hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to the regional schools. With respect to particular situations like the the cut at the middle school to the arts program, that that per capita thing com comparison to to the elementary schools is just not well. Um, <laughs> I don't receive it well because the level of instruction as children get older uh, needs to needs to meet their capabilities, and therefore I, I really think the position should be maintained. And absent, of course an immediate contribution or an agreement with Amherst College and with UMass with regard to the regional schools. My recommendation for consideration by the council is that while the regional process involves um, a, a process whereby with three of the four communities um, vote the budget, then the remaining community is obliged to pay whether or not they want to. Um, there, we've had previous discussions uh, in town of, of making gifts. And of course, gifts, gifts can be directed. And my opinion on a one-year basis, given the situation, the that everything has been through, I think the council should consider um, uh, in concert with the regional school committee, uh, targeted gifts to maintain certain programs because the history is that when you lose programs, 
it's easier to lose them than to get them back. And they and many things that have been lost in recessions and and tight budget years have not come back. Uh, witness the elementary school language program, and um, and I think it's a tragedy, quite frankly, when you have 50 languages spoken at a regional school district to have as few world languages being offered to students as we have. So. I think a targeted gift by the town of Amherst to the region for the purpose of supporting specific programs during this coming budget year that is going to be a tough one because of all the circumstances we're aware of, I think would be a a really worthwhile investment in the future of the regional schools. Um, that we, we simply don't need another, we don't need to encourage the existing charter schools or the, the establishment of additional charter schools by making, I think, very short-sighted, unwise cuts. And the town of Amherst can step in and do something about it. And, and if you can partner with the university and Amherst College, um, I think it would be wonderful to do that. But I think even with our own funds on a one year basis, I, I don't advise, Vince, you know, you doing something up. for 10 years out, but on a one year basis, I think um, of limiting the number of budget cuts in specific areas, which I think would have a detrimental effect on the, uh, on the future of the regional schools, I think would be a very wise action by the by the uh, council thank, thank you, you very much comments. thank you i'm going to ask us to use the clock and remind people to limit your comments to three minutes lydia irons please enter the room and state your name hi everyone i'm lydia irons i live at 43 jeffrey lane and um, I wanna start by thanking everyone here who is a citizen that stayed on this call so that they can speak up on this topic. And I know for my own self, it is a ton of work to keep track of these meetings and to read all your packets and to come prepared to speak. So thank you for all of those people too. Um, I wanna also thank Darcy Dumont for bravely pointing out what I know myself and other people that are listening in on this meeting have thought about the funding between departments. And I've been on school department meetings and I've been to these town council meetings and you all know what I'm gonna say, which is that there is money in budgets, in this town's budget, that it is incredible to me that we've been talking about this for over 40 minutes to have this argument over you know, what seems like in compared to the Amherst Police Department budget scraps. And I, you know, I come not just with my opinion, but also with research. So education is a public safety measure and the police department is directly at odds with that. I think that one of the things that you all really need to consider is that in taking any money out of the schools, you are actively defunding education in our town. I've been told time and time again that saying defund the police is bad press. It's a bad move, it's a bad look, but you're defunding education if you make any cuts to these school budgets. So instead of thinking about it like that, think about right-sizing the budgets in our town while simultaneously refunding our schools. So one study conducted by the Council for a Strong America, an organization that includes law enforcement leaders, found an increase in graduation rates by 10% points would prevent over 300,000 uh, violent crimes and nearly 175,000 aggravated assaults in America each year. When you think about it in this light, reducing school funding constitutes as a grave threat to public safety bloated police budgets in school districts that are lacking money for paraprofessionals, which will be taken out of this school's budget, 
psychologists, which was mentioned already in this call, and academic interventions such as arts aren't preventing crime. In fact, when you defund the schools, they may be an unintended, unintended contributor to it. So I would like you all to think back to the meetings that you have had where you have heard people talk about Amherst Police Department's bloated budget. And now think about how you have been hearing this debate here about the school's budget. And if you want to learn more, there's some really wonderful articles out on the internet, including one by Stephen Boatwright called Defund the Police. We've been doing that to schools for years. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Lydia. I want to remind people this is a hearing about the school budget. It is not about the town budget. It is about the regional school budget. Allegra, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. My name is Allegra Clark. I live at 189 Sherry Lane in District 2. Um, and I am a graduate of Amherst High School. And I am a future parent of two young children who will be in the school district eventually. Um, I am speaking tonight because I fundamentally oppose any cuts to the school budget, especially cuts that will support mental health programs and the arts. This past year has been taken a huge toll on our kids, taken a huge toll on our communities. And we have to think creatively about how to support them as they transition back into what a new normal will look like in school. So I've been on calls with the school committee where we've heard parent after parent talking about the mental health impacts that this pandemic has had and being at home has had on their kids. And to be cutting special ed services and mental health positions, it, it seems out of line with what the district is trying to do when it says that it's, it wants to support social and emotional well-being. Um, also, in terms of arts, some people can't process their feelings and their emotions by talking. So to have art as an outlet and I say this from my experience as a clinical social worker working with children in the criminal welfare system, well, both the criminal justice and the child welfare system. They've been able to create things and, and speak through pictures in ways that they couldn't do when, when sitting and talking to somebody. So to take away funding for art is just, I think, really doing a disservice to the kids that are really struggling right now. Um, I was at a webinar today that was discussing, you know, the drivers of involvement in the criminal justice system. And it spoke about um, access to te technology and STEM programs and access to arts and extracurriculars as having a huge impact on reducing disparities racially in school districts. And that was an, a program that was put on by the National Academy of Sciences. And it did talk about mental health care in schools as a way to help you know, reduce the disparity of who gets involved in the criminal justice system as well. So in passing, I will say, defund the police, refund education, care not cops. Allegra, thank you. Zoe Crabtree. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Lovely. My name is Zoe Crabtree. I live in District 5. Um, I just want to briefly say that I, I heard at the beginning of the presentation tonight about the school budget a lot of pride and joy about the diversity of the student population. Um, how that population is becoming more diverse over time, how the staff is becoming more diverse, um, and how one of the district's focuses is moving forward is really focusing on diversity and equity in the school. And I think that's lovely. I also heard um, that a lot of the students in the district are considered high need students by the state, 
and that many students are English language learners. Um, additionally, on page six of your presentation, the slides that talk about the student demographics, um, it shows that uh, compared to the 2017-2018 school year, the current school year has had um, an increase of number of students with disabilities, an increase in the number of students um, who are English language learners as well. Uh, which to me means <laughs> that services for the students would also need to increase. Um, and yet when I'm looking at the, the list of cuts, um, the cuts include, as we've talked about, uh, <laughs> options for um, bilingual psychology. I, it sounds like there's kind of a contracted workaround for that, um, but, and maybe it's still in process to try to find a, a person, but as the previous caller was saying, um, when positions get written out of budgets, uh, they often don't come back, even if you then were to find the right person. Um, other cuts include a special education teacher and three paraeducators and translation services. Those things all serve the students that are um, becoming a higher proportion of the students at the school and that I heard a lot of pride and joy um, about having in our district. Um, so that those don't seem to fit to me. Uh, and I think that if we're gonna be speaking so proudly about the diversity of our student population and the diversity of our staff um, and kind of touting that as a, as a positive thing about us, then we really need to be putting our money in line with those values um, instead of talking kind of performatively about uh, how well we're doing in that space, but at the same time, reducing funding that would support students. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, Kristen Rogers, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I guess I have a mix of questions and comments. So one of them is about um, in the beginning of the presentation, and I know because I've been part of the committee who's, who was talking about the sixth grade moving up to the middle school. So part of my question is about the um, cut to the art teacher. I know that that cut is related to decreased enrollment and numbers at the middle school being pretty low. Has that also been considered that when and if, hopefully when the sixth grade moves up to the middle school, um, what would those numbers look like? And then with that teacher being cut, would that also still support um, adequate art classes for the, you know, the sixth, seventh and eighth grade students um, is one question I have. And then a comment I have just about, I work in the schools, I'm um, an occupational therapist and I know we have students who have moved out of district. And so I think part of the paraprofessional cutting could have to do with that. But I also just wanna say that a lot of students um, because they missed so much school because they weren't able to access remote learning are returning with Quite a bit of deficits and we don't know what that's going to look like next year i'm hopeful that um it will look more positive than what we perhaps are are thinking it will but um i just would like to state the reality that a lot of these kids are going to need support and our paraprofessionals um are absolute lifesavers and in being able to support those kids um, access the curriculum in the way that they need so Thank you all for your work on this, um, Mr. Slaughter and Allison and Mike. That was great. Uh, Do you mind if I respond to that? Because there was a question please. in there. Um, yeah. Is that okay? So please. I think the, the short answer for the uh, sixth grade, if sixth grade moves up to the middle school, the, the most likely scenario, I'm being very cautious in my words, but the most likely scenario would be that the uh, if sixth grade students from the town of Amherst um, were educated at Amherst Regional Middle School, that there would have to be a lease or rental agreement of space. It's less likely, in my opinion, that there would be a full redo of the regional agreement. Now, as such, any staff members who would be uh, working with sixth graders would be members of the Amherst Public Schools, not the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. So in terms of sixth graders moving up, uh, any reductions at the region would not have an impact on that conversation because there are different districts and likely would stay will stay different districts moving forward uh, but that's really in the weeds um you know certainly could follow up with me on any thoughts or any of us on any thoughts about that sixth grade question as, as was mentioned earlier we'll be re-engaging that next month i was just going to say that is a question that 
you will be re-engaging and eventually I'm sure we will. Um, Bridget Hayes, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Bridget Hines, I'm sorry. Hi there, can you hear me? My name is Julianne Hines, I apologize. I'm using my mom's computer. Um, I hope you can hear me, but I would like to make a comment um, as to the cutting of the school budget, um, particularly the regional school budget. I know that one of the positions to be cut in the arts department was actually my art teacher last year. Um, and that uh, I have many friends um, whom will be going into the high school after over a year of remote learning, who will be needing more support and any more support that is done obviously comes along with needing more funding, um, not less. So what I would say is, I think we're going in the opposite direction of where we need to go, given that, um, that the pandemic has exacerbated the need to fund education um, and to fund the, uh, the mental, social, emotional, and uh, educational health of all our students, not just some. Um, and I would say that whether finding that funding in another overfunded department, for example, the police department, or finding that funding through Amherst College, as was mentioned um, by a former high school student in the Amherst Indy and the Gazette, or um, if we find that funding in payment of lieu of taxes through UMass or in some other way, um, I would strongly encourage you to use every open avenue of where you can find the funding to make up these cuts before you decide to cut this exact budget. Um, what I would leave you with is that, um, is that it is when you are cutting or asking for money from somewhere like the police department um, or Amherst College or UMass, you know that is already a department or an area that has most of the money they need to do um, their jobs. And what I would say is that uh, the schools, both nationwide and within our town, have, uh, have not had the money they needed for a long time. And the cuts that are made do not always come back, as we have seen um, in the last financial crisis. So what I would leave you with is to explore all possible avenues of refunding the schools um, instead of cutting the budget when there is dire need. I see my time running out and I thank you for your, your welcoming of my comment. Julian, nice to have you join us tonight. I hope you've been well. Uh, Marisol Pierce Bonifaz, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Lynn. My name is Marisol Pierce Bonifaz. I live on 30 Harris Street and I am from District 1. I'm gonna speak from a letter that Arne Andrews and I published uh, or tried to publish to the Daily Hampshire Gazette. As young people growing up in Amherst, we have seen the local government prioritize the Amherst Police Department over our education. Amherst Police Department officers' salaries are 87% above average and 6% higher than teachers. With a 5.15 million police department budget, we see no need to cut Amherst education system and strip Amherst youth of an adequate accessible learning environment. As students of Pioneer Valley Performing Arts, a school outside of Amherst, it is alarming and disappointing that we feel the pressing need to speak our voices on a decision that should be simple. Does Amherst prioritize the raising of young people in this town or do we prioritize the police? Cutting the budget of the Amherst high school is especially dangerous during this pandemic. The stress of adapting to these challenging circumstances is universally felt by students and teachers across all school districts as we try to recreate the same educational experience at a distance, keeping mental health as a priority. All schools are already struggling with the same available, small available funds to keep going, and taking that away from the Amherst schools would put students and teachers' mental stability, education, and overall well-being at risk. At this pivotal point in our country, amidst a national crowd to fund the police due to police brutality and racial discrimination, we must decide who we want to become. 
Will we be a country looking to the past, following the grim history of unjust law enforcement, or to our future, the children and me, currently in the education system you wish to defund? The history of police comes from slave patrols, an institution dead set on suppressing people of color. We cannot treat everyone equally and protect every person in the United States and in Amherst if we are to constantly put the police department before fundamental rights. We cannot treat everyone equally if we are con continuously recreating the past instead of empowering the future. Town Council and Town Manager Paul Bachelman, please cut the Amherst Police Department instead of the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools budget. The result of this budget cut to our schools would be all too dire. And thank you, Darcy, for bringing this to light on the council. Thank you for your comments, Marisol. Margaret Sawyer, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see you all tonight. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm a parent of a fourth grader and a first grader at Fort River. Um, and I work at the Pioneer Valley Workers Center. Um, I just wanna first appreciate that the school district um, did a great job today. My first grader got arrived very happily at school and um, my fourth grader is excited to go back to. Um, and as an elementary school parent, I appreciate that the district has um, been committed to uh, what I see. I've seen a lot of commitment to equity and to trying to do their best um, to serve students. I hope that there'll be some creative thinking about how to maintain um, staffing as much as possible um, these positions that are being considered for cuts are really important and I especially work closely with the Family Center, the Amherst Family Center, and I was really concerned to see that there would be a cut there. Um, the, that community center knows the parents of our students so well and um, does a great job. The, a lot of the paraprofessionals too that I've seen on the elementary level um, have done such a good job looking out for students. So I hope that um, folks can be creative here. I share the concern that the police budget is too high. Um, and I hope we can be creative in finding some better ways to preserve the school's funding. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Margaret. I'm going to come back to the council at this point, ask if there's any additional questions from the council. Um, before we take a break. Alyssa. So, so I have three things that might be better hand, well, two of which might be better handled by a simple email to the finance committee. We'll see. Um, one is associated with, well, we've heard a good bit tonight, as well as of course in the press leading up till tonight, associated with mental health and wellness. And while there is one little mission vision slash paragraph about that in the slides, that phraseology, mental health or wellness isn't mentioned in any of the line items. I know they're very munis driven, but again, as part of telling our story to show people that we are ready to welcome students back, I think it's helpful that the school committee, which I know has discussed this, can help the town council express this as well, since we have district meetings and other methods of outreach with people um, and not just the people who have kids in school right now who are more paying attention to school committee things are people who are very, very concerned that we do have enough money set aside for this. One assumes the way we're paying for that since there's no evidence we're paying for it through the budget based on the way the line items are labeled is that we're paying for it with federal money. And so that may come out as part of that conversation Lynn mentioned associated with CARES Act money. But again, you know, telling our story to show people, yes, we're doing sensible things. I trust the school committee to do those things. I would just like them to help me be able to explain them to other people. In terms of the slightly more technical things that are um, perhaps better for finance committee, there was a document placed in our packet several days ago, which I appreciate very much that we had it. That's um, 8A budget related motions, regional school committee 03232021. It doesn't make any sense to me that we as a town council were given a document with draft motions on it. Those aren't the final motions that were voted because if they were voted, they would have a quantum of vote on them because you had a remote meeting. There's one small date at the top that says March 23rd. That document feels very drafty to me and is not 
helpful to me in terms of understanding, was this something you were gonna vote on? Is this something you actually voted on? So if we could have that technicality taken care of in future, that we're only given things that show actual votes of things, not just assumed votes. And one of those, of course, was in regards to my final item, which is associated with the um, region with the capital items. And we already had the conversation about how the motion said select boards, cause you know, copy paste from year to year. But the other part of that is, is for the town council's benefit. I think we need to have the finance committee discuss how it is that the finance committee can automatically get that letter every year and tell us the town council, whether or not we should hold such a meeting within 60 days because very traditionally in Amherst, I think I fixed it one year that I was chair of select board. We just let that go by because right, the default is, of course, we already talked about it at four towns meetings. Of course, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that you know we just don't worry about it. It feels like we ought to be able to refer it directly to finance committee when it comes in without town council having to do anything except Lynn to say, hey, here. And then the finance committee say back to us to town council, yep, that's exactly all the stuff we talked about. No need to have a meeting. It's awesome. Or if there is something, but if there's no process associated with that, it's easy for that to kind of just slip under the radar and it feels like we shouldn't let it do that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Mandy Jo? Yeah, I just wanted to, in, in response to a number of the comments, um, echo uh, Superintendent Morris's indication, and I think Dr. Slaughter's indication, that um, some of the budget uh, tightness is not necessarily related to the assessments that the towns have been paying. It's related to level funding at the state and the drop in the percentage of state funds that are supporting a regional budget and a local school budget as it compares to the amount of the local funds that are supporting it. So I want to encourage everyone um, that commented tonight that believes the, the school budget is underfunded to talk to our state rep, Mindy Dom, and our state senator, Joe Comerford, um, and urge them to when the state's going through their funding process to increase funding uh, to schools um, on the state level, because it really has been a, I, I think Dr. Slaughter or, Mike, or Superintendent Morris can, can tell us exactly what the percentage used to be like a decade ago and what it is now. Um, and that might be something useful to hear, but it really has had a dramatic effect on just funding in general of schools. Thank you, very good point. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yeah, just uh, since we're nearing a conclusion tonight, um, on behalf of the Finance Committee, um, to remind uh, fellow counselors and the public at large that um, the Finance Committee, when it adjourns tonight, will reconvene tomorrow at 2 p.m. And this is the um, only real item on the agenda to continue the discussion of the regional schools. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the process um, so that the, uh, for the um, uh, counselors who are interested in continuing the discussion, it did not get posted as a council meeting so that um, if there's more than one additional counselor there besides the five who are on the finance committee, um, they um, you, you would have to be in the attendee group. Um, but what I'm going to be doing as chair then is to make sure that I am very um, early in the agenda as we're talking, having the discussion within the finance committee of um, seeing what counselors want to raise questions and um, do that um, as a part of the beginning of public comment so that uh, there would be time to um, address further questions tomorrow. And I um, think it's the only process that we can use at this point. Um, the other option is what's been mentioned by a couple of counselors and you're welcome to do this. And that is to forward questions and uh, we will um, ask the questions that are forwarded to us. So, um, just wanted to touch on those process things. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, Shalini, do you have a comment or question? I had a question about um, um, the, will, will the report from the community safety working group with the police be available to us in time to affect the budgeting for the police? And, and I'm sorry, I didn't understand the answer to the question around whether that funding can be used for schools. Melanie, that actually will come up later when okay. uh, we discuss the memo from Paul. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Andy, I'm gonna call on you to adjourn the finance committee. Yes, um, so the finance committee is adjourned. Uh, I want to thank the resident members for uh, attending this evening and uh, finance committee, as I just said, will reconvene tomorrow at 2 p.m. And I want to thank uh, the school chair and vice chair, Margaret, for being with us tonight and also uh, Mike and Doug. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, the hearing is now adjourned. The council is going to take a five minute break and come back immediately. Please, when you come back, put your video back on, but make sure you mute. Okay. Um, we are actually have, in addition to the specific public comment periods we had tonight, we also have general public comment. Um, this is on items that we've not spoken to or even whatever, whatever it is you would like to speak to. Um, please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to make a general public comment. Lynn, is this our last public comment of the night? It is. Just to let people Thank know you that. For that clarification. Is there any other public comment at this time? All right, seeing none, then we are going to move on to the consent agenda. And uh, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. Uh, to remove an item, please let me know. Uh, to remove an item does not require a second. Uh, the motion is as follows and I'll be looking for a second. To move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. Suspend town council rules of procedure Rule 8.4 for the following agenda item. 8C, amendment to town manager public safety goal. Um, 8A, referral of school, um, regional school budget to finance committee. And 11A, approval of minutes from March 22nd, 2021, regular town council meeting and March 22nd, 2021 one special town council meeting minutes public forum. Is there a second? Well, Ross, second. Okay, thank you. Are there any items that anybody wishes to remove? Seeing no hands, I'm going to go ahead and begin the vote with Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Stanley Balmill. Yes. Consent agenda passes 13 0, 0 and no absence. 
we have no resolutions, we have no presentation. And so we are going to move immediately to the Jones Library appropriation. Let me begin this by saying, because of a potential appearance of favoritism or influence as defined by Mass General Law, Chapter 268A, Paragraph 23B3, to the Jones Library item we will now discuss. I asked two counselors to in individually contact the Massachusetts State Ethics Commission and discuss their perceived conflict. Counselors Dorothy Pam and Andy Steinberg have done exactly that and have filed a statement with our town clerk. I am now going to call on Councillor Pam and then Councillor Steinberg and have each of them read their statements and ask that they be appended to the minutes of tonight's meeting. Dorothy. As an Amherst town councilor and member of its finance committee, I consider and vote on many issues, including those with respect to the Jones Library. My husband, Robert Pam, is an elected member of the board of trustees and treasurer of that library. The town council acts on the annual budget of the Jones Library and will decide on whether to contact, contract with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the renovation slash expansion of the library or to limit the town to its repair. My husband has no financial interest in the library, nor is he paid for his services. As treasurer of the Jones Library, he reports on the financial status of the library. I will continue to make my decisions based on the presentations and materials that are being provided to all council members and have concluded that I can be fair and objective when I perform my official duties. Dorothy S. Pam, Amherst, Massachusetts, Town Councilor, District 3. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Andy. Uh, please unmute Andy. Sorry. Uh, let me try it again. And I've said, since I need to look at the, uh, the, the uh, disclosure that I filed with the Ethics Commission um, after consulting with commission staff um, notes that my wife is a part-time hourly employee in the library working approximately six hours per week and additionally as needed uh, and uh, though it is generally limited to the six hours. Um, I have noted in the, and I'm going to read this section, that public employees may not participate in their public position in matters in which they or any member of the immediate family have a personal financial interest. I have consulted with the Ethics Commission and determined that neither I nor a member of my family will have any financial benefit or loss as a result of the council decisions on the matters that are coming before um, the council tonight. Thank you, Andy. Um, and we will make sure that both of those statements are appended to the minutes. Um, Andy, we're going to move on to a finance committee report with regard to the Jones Library appropriation. I'm going to uh, really rely on the written report and more importantly, um, a lengthy document of um, questions that came from not just members of the Finance Committee, but members of the Council and, um, and from the public at large that were responded to over the course of two different meetings. And uh, the, we, um, as a Finance Committee, spent considerable time um, reviewing that information, asking additional questions, um, which is why it actually stretched over, in part why it stretched over to meetings. And uh, the, that has been provided uh, to you in the packet um, in this, um, alongside what was really a very brief report. Um, the Finance Committee uh, voted that um, the um, information uh, is, is a thank you, and maybe I should uh, 
see if I can quick, well, I don't, I'm not going to, uh, because you have the, the motion as passed in the finance committee report, but we had great appreciation for all of the staff, town staff, library staff, volunteers to the library, library trustees who provided information. Um, we had um, great confidence in the information presented after the amount of uh, time that was uh, spent uh, talking with the, the committee. And we found that um, the uh, presentation is a, is a um, financially uh, that we had confidence in the information presented. Um, and the last thing that I'll just note is that uh, we had made a determination early on um, that um, our goal was not to make a specific recommendation to you, but to just review information and um, uh, report that information back to you and validate the information, but not to make a recommendation. So I think that's the report. Thank you, Andy. So let me just explain. We have uh, three potential motions uh, before the council. I'm going to start each section by reading the motion and asking for a second, and then we'll have council discussion. And then if there's any further discussion, we'll take the vote on that motion and move on to the next motion. The first motion is regarding the CPA funds. The second motion is regarding the overall bond bonding. Should we decide that we are accepting the grant from the Mass Board of Library Commissions? And the third motion is not, we do not need to authorize the town manager to accept the grant. So there is no motion for that. MBLC is very clear that as long as we pass the bond, then the, the town manager is authorized. However, the third motion then is to authorize the town manager to enter into the MOU with Jones Library Inc. So um, I'm going to begin uh, the first by reading the motion and then I'm looking for a second. In accordance with charter section 5.6, having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on March 25th, 2021, a public forum held on April 5th, 2021, and having been reviewed by the finance committee report of April 5, 2021, to adopt council order FY22-08A, an order appropriating and authorizing debt for special collections facilities of the Jones Library under historic preservation as presented. Is there a second? Ryan, second. Thank you. Council discussion, please raise your hand. Kathy Shane. Um, yeah, I have a, a few questions about this. Um, so one is um, the CPA request uh, for support uh, initially came as a surprise to me because the library um, has put it under the column of private fundraising and it's taxpayer dollars. So a question I had raised at the very beginning of when the library had said the town taxpayer share would be 15.751 million, um, whether the CPA was part of that 15 or is it an additional 1 million. If we vote on this now, are we saying, could it still be part or are we saying it is over and above the second ask, which is from the general revenue. So that's a question. Okay. If we vote on this motion, the way it is general, it is stated now and been made and seconded, this million dollars would go toward the fundraising of the library. So voting against it wouldn't be, if you vote against it, it's not necessarily that you don't wanna spend the money, but you want it to be counted in a different way. That would be 
one option. Another option would be to try to amend the motion. Okay, then can I ask a second question? Um, I don't think we've been told, but how, what is the assumption on how long the long-term debt for the CPA fund, uh, CPA resources, do we know what kind of interest rate and what in addition to the million dollars we'll be drawing on? Again, I'm, I'm gonna keep calling this taxpayer money because it's tax, it's a surcharge on our taxes. Do we have that um, amount? Do we know how much that is? John Mangano has raised his hand to answer that question. So our financial advisor um, did model the debt for this project or for this portion of the project. And so he modeled it using a 10 year um, repayment schedule. And I think the debt payments ranged um, around 110,000 per year. It fluctuated based on the way he structured the debt, um, but it was between like 107, and I think it may have got as high as 115 in a given year. Um, if people wanna see the exact debt schedule, it'd take me a little bit to find it, but I could bring it up if it's, um, if people want to see the specific schedule. No, that, that, that's enough for me. Thank you. All right. Are there other questions on this motion? Okay. Then seeing no other questions, we're going to move to a vote. I start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. No. Griesmer, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. No. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Motion passes 10, four, three against, no abstentions and no absence. So the motion passes, it did require a two thirds vote. Okay, the second motion is in accordance with Charter Section 5.6, having been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on March 25th, 2021, a public forum held on April 5th, 2021, and having been reviewed by the Finance Committee report of April 5th, 2021, to adopt Council Order FY21-06. C, an order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund the expansion and restoration of the Jones Library bond authorizations as presented. Is there a second? Yeah, Ryan, second. second. Okay. Is there, are there questions? Kathy Shane. Um, it's it's a question, but I also think for the benefit of the public, they should know what the content of the financial order is. And so one of the things I wanted to raise in my comments is that we are being asked, um, there is a grant of 30, the total project is 36.3 million and the library has said it will raise an amount um, that will help shrink the gap between that and the grant and that the town will then pay 15.75 million but we're being asked to take on the full debt the full difference because the library has not raised that amount of money so that this is in fact um, a pretty in my opinion a high financial risk because as you can see from the financial order it's more in the neighborhood of 20 22 million that the town will be taking on and then part of it will be an interest free loan that will be repaid by the trustees when they um, if they can get the pledges. So we have to hope that that will happen and we have a memorandum of understanding that we can tap into the endowment fund or potentially put a lean on the building, but we don't really have this secured the library is not putting up money so that's the financial order 
also portrays what I think, what has always concerned me. I love the library and I want it to be renovated. I think it needs repairs, but I think we're at high cost risks. And no matter how many questions I've asked, I still have uncertainty that we will actually keep our share to what is, when I add CPA and the ask, um, $16.8 million. It's a lot more, two and a half million dollars more than the repair estimate, but it could be still more if we don't get that paid back. So I just, Lynn, the way it's worded is just, it's a financial order, but the financial order lays out what the town is committing to in terms of bond. I'm going to, for the purposes of this discussion, have Athena put the financial order up on the screen. And then I'm going to ask if other comments, if other counselors have comments they would like to make. Mandy Jo Haneke. Thank you. It's the first time we've really had to have a chance to comment on this whole project. So I wanted to say a century ago, the Jones Library trustees had a vision of a library. It would be more than just a warehouse for books. The building would look and feel like a home. It would be welcome and support residents desire to learn not just from books, but from each other. The building would welcome performers and speakers. It would not be just a building for learning, but it would be a building for community. And 95 years later, that vision is still alive. It's a place where our residents go to learn, to relax, to socialize, and to become part of our community. It is our living room, our office, our library, and our entertainment space. It's a place to find books, a place to learn a new language in a new country, a place where a parent and a child new to town can meet other families, a place where a resident who has no home can spend a day out of the heat or cold. It's a place where people can be less lonely and socialize with others. It's a place where a student can study without distraction, or where teens can work on group projects without the worry of being judged by the size or condition of their own homes. It's a place where someone without a computer or broadband at home can search for and apply for a job. And it's a place to enrich ourselves culturally without needing to spend money. The Jones is a second home for all of us. And 100 years on, that home needs to be upgraded and expanded to be able to carry out these needs for the next 50 years. Our job as counselors is to serve the residents, a large majority of whom based on past trustee elections and statements to us support this project. It is also our job to vote in accordance with our policy goals. This year's performance goals and objectives for the town manager include six goals that directly relate to this vote. We told the manager we would evaluate his job performance based on making forward progress on these areas. We ourselves must also act to show we are serious about these goals. A yes vote helps us meet the climate action goals we adopted in 2019 by getting rid of the fossil fuel heating system and dramatically improving the energy efficiency in one of our largest public buildings. A yes vote helps our future economic health and well being by bringing more visitors to town. A yes vote addresses social justice in our society by providing sufficient space for programs that serve the less privileged among us, those that have no home, those that don't speak English, those that don't have a computer or broadband at home and those that have trouble navigating stairs and other impediments. A yes vote is financially prudent with an eye to the long term, given the nearly identical costs the town would incur to repair the building with a fossil fuel heating system and little improvement in energy efficiency. A yes vote ensures that the building will serve our residents over the next 50 years, while spending nearly the same money just on repairs does not. As a council, we cannot expect the manager to follow our goals if we ourselves do not. The time is now to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. I urge my fellow counselors to vote yes, and I will proudly and enthusiastically vote yes. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Uh, Darcy Dumont. I uh, very much respect the amount of time and work that's been put into this project by so many people committed to the Jones. Uh, a library that we all love. Despite that, I have many concerns about the proposal for the expansion renovation project. The fact that our own finance committee didn't make an affirmative recommendation um, um, 
was concerning to me. Um, these are my main concerns. First, I believe that the town needs to look at the full picture of our capital and operating budget needs for the next decade and to get input from the residents. Let's look at our critical needs first. For many in town, the library is the lowest priority of the building plans after public safety, public works, and schools. And those are just the buildings. That doesn't take into account all of our other capital needs. To me, the library expansion is not a need, it's a want. I'm afraid that a vote to fund this major project will convince folks to vote against the school project when the school override vote comes up. In addition to not looking at the full picture of our standard needs, we need to be factoring in our new goals of racial equity and climate action. The proposed climate action and resilience plan is slated to come before the council in just a few weeks and will include plans for what we need to do to cut emissions by 25% by 2025. There will be short and long-term initiatives that may take priority over other existing spending plans. We should not be committing to a major expenditure before knowing what is being proposed in that plan. Secondly, the Library Sustainability Committee, um, as great as it was, um, I very much respect all the people on the committee, didn't look at, uh, wasn't asked to look at emissions for what I believe is the most climate friendly option, renovating uh, and retrofitting the existing building to make it more energy efficient using renewably sourced energy. It only looked at how to make the expansion project sustainable and not providing a comparison to this option is really hard to get past. Also comparing the projected emissions of the expansion project to leaving the building as is, is not helpful. When leaving the building as is, is not one of the options that was on the table. And assuming that the emissions of the as is model would remain the same over a 60 year period is simply not correct um, because it would need to be um, retrofitted to take it off fossil fuels under any new climate action plan. And it would be using renewably sourced community choice energy. Um, uh, additionally, I agree with the suggestions that we should try to design any library expansion or any municipal building so that it also gives our, clown, cl our town a climate resilience hub, which would provide power during powder, power outages and other climate emergencies and a heating and cooling center for vulnerable residents. Northampton is planning its first, first such resilience hub. Lastly, I see the need to preserve more money in the operating budget. Our wonderful staff is way too stretched. Many positions needed to make us the town that we could be are not being filled. I'm also quite concerned that funding the project would impact the operating budgets and services of the other branch libraries. In the era of two global emergencies, the climate crisis and the pandemic, we need to be planning for new priorities and how we can best provide the basic of, for our residents in the era of the new normal. Our overall priority should determine our way forward, not the existence of grant money. Thank you, Darcy. Evan Ross, I'm, I just want to point out we are limiting people to their three minutes. Evan? Yes, thank you. So I'm going to speak tonight in support of the project as proposed because I do believe that it represents progress for our community on a number of fronts, but specifically, I'm going to echo some of the statements about how it aligns with our values of sustainability and social justice. So back in November 2019, we passed pretty ambitious climate goals that I'm proud of. And the Andrean Climate Action Committee is in the progress of developing a climate action plan. Uh, but climate action goals and a climate action plan are only value, valuable if they're followed by action. So approving this project would be the most significant action that this council, this sitting council will take on climate. The project will make our library net zero ready, eliminate on-site fossil fuels and dramatically decrease energy use. And when, and I mean when, not if, when we decarbonize our electric grid, our library will be able to serve our community without emitting carbon into our atmosphere. And to me, 
this project helps us take a tangible step towards our climate action goals and sends a strong message to our community that we are serious about achieving those goals, whereas forfeiting this opportunity now will only make it more difficult down the road to achieve those adopted goals. I've also often said that I believe that the library project is the biggest social justice project facing our council, and I do believe that. Uh, we've heard in, in some emails and in forums uh, that, quote, the library works fine for me, or, quote, I like the library the way it is. And for many, I'm sure that's true. You know, for me, a native English speaker who is able bodied, who has a computer at home, and who uses the library primarily to check out books, uh, especially quite a bit during COVID, uh, the library does work just fine as is for me. But for so many in our community, the library is not working. For folks using it to access technology, for folks using it to learn English or prepare for a citizenship test, for folks um, who have physical disabilities and mobility impairments, the library does not work. So if you are someone who says the library works fine as is, if you're someone who sees this project as a want and not a need, consider that that is in part because of your privilege and that maybe this project isn't for you. It might be time right now for us to check our privilege and to consider that for many, the library as is, is not working. And if we are committed to social justice for our low income population, for our immigrant population, our disabled populations, we should support this project. And I'm voting yes for those populations, not for people like me for whom the library already works. And we can do this project and work towards those climate action goals and social justice goals for a cost that is on par with doing basic repairs. We can do it without an override and without raising taxes. We can do it by taking advantage of state funds and significant fundraising, including nearly $1.2 million already committed before a project has even been approved. Think of how much more can be raised after our vote tonight. Those state funds and fundraising dollars are not available if we turn this project down. So to me, a yes vote is the fiscally prudent vote. I know that the project might not be perfect, Maybe you think it's too big or you don't like the shape of the roof or where the teen room is, but we can't let perfect be the enemy of progress. So I'm urging all of my fellow counselors to vote yes on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Dorothy Pam. Um, thank you. Um, I have two types of comments, the practical and the emotional. Okay. We have talked about this library for a long time, and I certainly have been amongst those who have questioned many, many of the assumptions, the plans, the design, the financing. And I feel very proud of the work that many people on this council have done in making us come up with a better plan or helping us to encourage uh, changes in design. And I think that we've come to a place now where it's prudent to go forward. Um, we have many things that we have to think about, but I, at the moment, I think the emotional fact is more important to me. We have, we're just coming off, knock on wood, from an incredible year. I lost two birthdays, a year of staying inside, of seeing no one, of not even seeing my grandchildren for months on end. And the town, when you drive out your car in town, there's nobody on the streets. It's quiet as can be. So we are hoping to come together as a civil, social, um, intellectual, um, political body again. And the library is going to be, I think, the place where we're going to do it. I am hoping, positively looking forward to the new reading room on the second floor that's gonna have these little skylights. I think it's gonna be a place that we want to be. We're gonna have the teen room that we've asked for. And we heard uh, last meeting um, that the Civil War stones tablets will be placed in the um, ground floor meeting room, which will be a very meaningful thing. So we have this library, it's right in the heart of downtown. And we're hoping for a reawakening of our town, of our society. And at this moment, having gone through the budgets and talked all the time, at some point you just have to take things on faith. And I'm going to make the leap of faith and trust that the work and the numbers that we have, that we have been shown are accurate and that we'll be able to do it. And I will also hold the board of trustees to their promise that if they have cost overruns, they will not come back to the town, that they will go and do additional fundraising. I think that's a very important thing and a very important matter that was brought up. But 
that we can come together once again at the library and be together in Amherst. So that is my hope. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Andy. So I wanted to, I guess, respond to a couple things that were said and just generally speak about the, in, in favor of uh, this motion. Um, one comment was made that the finance committee did not make recommendation and something should be read into that. And I want to make it clear that that is absolutely not the case. We were asked not to make a recommendation because we uh, were looking at this as a finance committee certification on financial information and investigation of financial information, but the, um, the uh, decision belonged to the council. So that the motion, the, the motion that we passed within the uh, committee, the finance committee was very specific and said the finance committee finds that the information provided in this document, and this was referring to the long document, is a reasonable projection of the costs and funding plan for the renovation expansion plan and the repair alternatives and recommends that the council rely on this information. Um, so going on to then uh, my own personal uh, assessment of this, uh, I served on the uh, Joint Capital Planning Commission Committee for a number of years when uh, we recognized that there were significant repair needs for the library and uh, a deliberate decision was made to not do the repairs because of uh, that uh, we would have an opportunity to do them in the future when we made a decision that we're making tonight. Um, the reality is that the repair costs are going to be pretty much the same as the cost that the town will ultimately have to bear. And finally, knowing that I'm running out of time, um, I also want to um, respond to an assertion that was made earlier that we are uh, taking on a huge risk. I don't think that we are taking on a huge risk. I think the Memorandum of Understanding provides substantial security. It has been carefully drafted to achieve that result. And uh, I don't, and, and I am very impressed that the uh, uh, fundraising has already raised well over a million dollars in donations, and that there are a number of people who've indicated that based upon the vote tonight, if it is favorable, that they will um, uh, make donations. So there's a lot of money yet to come in. Um, I recommend, I am very strongly supportive of this uh, motion. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, many of you in the community and on the council have talked with me about your objections to the project. And I acknowledge that voting yes is taking risks. Will the trustees meet their fundraising goal? Will project costs be held in check? Will we retain our commitment to sustainability if we face burgeoning costs? Will the project keep us from completing the other capital projects, the firehouse, the DPW, the school project, and renovation of Cracker Farm? But not doing this project takes risks also. Um, piecemeal repairs that will cost almost as much as the renovation expansion, losing state funding and losing credibility with state funders ongoing impacts to English language learners, low-income residents, and limited space for community gatherings, which in the past have included use by members of the Muslim community, workshops on anti-racism, book groups, political meetings, and the usual contentious community meetings. And in the end, I come down on the risks of saying yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Steve Schreiber. My colleagues have really said much better what I'm going to say, but we've heard a lot about how from the public that they think that we should be prioritizing public safety schools and infrastructure. 
And I can't think of a project in our community that exemplifies all three of those. So libraries are all about education and more so it's about education of everyone. Libraries are the most democratic buildings. You know, um, Town Commons also democratic, but libraries are literally the most democratic institution invented in this country. Proud that Massachusetts was a pioneer in this. Proud that Amherst was had the foresight to um, invest in a public library a hundred years ago. Uh, public safety, we've heard a lot about how education and public safety are linked to each other. So the more education, the less need for policing. And I, uh, so much about this library is about exactly that, finding a safe place for members of our community to become engaged with the community. And then infrastructure. So we can define infrastructure the way the Biden administration is, which is pretty much everything, or we can think specifically about things like computers. So we got emails from longtime residents of Amherst about how the public library was the first place where they could access the internet. So we don't know what the next infrastructure um, uh, developments that will, will happen in the future, but we expect that they'll come through the, the public library. So in my remaining minute, I just want to make another, I want to make a, there's been a lot of discussion about the tenant. The greenest building is the one that's already built. There's another tenant, which is called cash for clunkers. So cash for clunkers is a real thing that, and in fact, one of our fellow counselors implored the entire town council a year ago. I went back and looked at the email, but she implored all of us to get rid of our gas using vehicles and trade those in for electric vehicles. And as part of that messaging was the fact that the state and federal government had a discount. So basically there was an incentive for us to get our gas guzzlers off the street. So, you know, quite frankly, I see this as a cash for clunkers on steroids. It's something that serves the entire community. It's all about the social capital as opposed to electric vehicles, or which, which are all about the individual. So I strongly support this, this project. Thank you, Steve. Sarah Schwartz. So the library is incredibly important to me. Um, Pre-pandemic, I have visited the library with my children at least five times a week. Uh, four years ago, when my family met poverty standards, I still served the library as many ways as I could, including doing story time and taking um, toys and puppets home to clean them on my own time and bring them back to the library. There's been a lot of talk about equality tonight. I have to ask everyone in this room that's at this meeting who is either a town employee or who represents the town as an elected officer, how many of us have missed a paycheck since March 16th, 2019, which was the beginning of the pandemic? I would wager not too many of us. Um, I guess I'm going to go out of this council speaking for the middle class, which I don't think anybody has addressed. Um, we've heard from people that there are young, rich families who would like to settle here and they can pay these taxes and this is what they want. Um, we all know that the library is the most democratic place and I think it's incredibly important. And we know that it serves people who are poverty level. I come from a district where there's a lot of working class people and people who have told me that they cannot hang out for much longer with the increasing, we just increased sewer, we just increased water. Um, that's going to be like another $136 for people, people who are working, people who are on a fixed income. Not everybody's fixed income is real high. So for me, we're looking at we're looking at these projects, and I have to say it seems like we're taking a very expensive one first. People mention the school because we've been in a position where we are told we we have to do the school the way the school needs to be, and then we're telling DPW and Fire, well, you haven't gotten anything for a hundred years. 
not sure we can do it now. If I'm concerned, I'm concerned about people being able to stay in town. And I do not believe that middle class people in five years will be able to. And I'm, I'm gonna vote against the project as much as I love the library. And hopefully those of us who will have to leave town will be somewhere in the CW Mars area so that we could visit the new library. Thank you, Sarah. George. As I was thinking what I wanted to say tonight, I knew that, that many of my colleagues would, would hit the major points and they have. I was thinking more historically, I guess. It's been almost a hundred years um, it was in the second decade of the 20th century that Samuel Minot Jones presented Amherst with his extraordinary gift, a gift that has become, as we've noted many times tonight, one of the jewels of our town. This evening, we have the opportunity to enhance that gift and to pass it on to the generations that will come after us. This proposal will restore and expand, as Steve and Sarah have noted, our most democratic space and ensure its ability to fulfill its multifaceted and vital mission well into the 21st century. A library today is so much more than a place to house books. It's a key community resource that serves us in so many ways. Much like the Amherst of Samuel Minot Jones's day, we too are emerging from a global pandemic. Like them, we need now more than ever as Dorothy suggested, to believe in the future and the possibilities of our town. We can't be afraid. We need to provide those who will come after us with the tools they will need to ensure that this town continues to prosper and to flourish. Like Samuel Minot Jones, now is the time for vision and for courage. And Sarah, we do have a financial plan that allows us to undertake three of the four major capital projects without recourse to a debt exclusion. A financial plan that will allow us to fund them through the capital budget without increasing our taxes. This proposal is fiscally responsible and it represents all that is the best of our town. What we need tonight is courage and vision to do the right thing. Thank you, George. Shalini? Um, yeah, I think a lot of things have been said and there are two things that I, that I wanna to add to the conversation. One is something that Todd Holland, who's an engineer stated earlier, that most of the arguing can lead to inaction and inaction is the only wrong move today. Um, the other thing that's really important is something that Sarah is talking about and we're hearing from a lot of, um, um, residents is the high property taxes and the burden this would put. And, and as George just mentioned that we have a plan and yes, it could go off, but we do have one plan. And the other part is the library is part of that vision. It's part of the solution. It, it is not going to increase our property taxes. We need to have, we need to solve for that problem of high property taxes, but not by saying no to the library. On the contrary, we need to think about how can we revitalize our economy? How can we draw more people and the right kind of development, not moratoriums, but the right kind of development? We could be losing $800,000 by stopping any kind of development. I know this is not about the moratorium, it's about the library, but my point is that we are saying no to the library for property taxes is one of the reasons and that they're not related. And we do need to think about that and we should be, and I believe the library is gonna to add to the economic vitality. And there is the concept of social infrastructure, which someone shared with us, one of the residents shared with us, and the importance of investing in social infrastructure, which is the glue that binds a community together, especially in a time of divisiveness, especially when there's so little hope and people are just so uh, broken down. We need this hope. We need this new building to come and, and be right there to bring all of us together from different walks of life. And so 
I think um, I am fully in support of this. And I also want to mention that as of today, the library, without even us passing the vote, has raised two million and one hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars. Of course, that includes one million from CPA, but. I am confident, I believe in the residents of Amherst that they will, we will raise. And the more we raise the money together, the more we are investing in our own town. And it's again, another reason that we are together proud of, of our town. So I'm gonna vote for it. Thank you, Shalini. Um, I'm going to use my privilege as a counselor. And while this may come as a surprise to many of you, I began the process of reviewing the Jones Library proposal to the Mass Board of Library Commissioners as a skeptic. However, after two years of helping to manage the process of bringing this vote to the Town Council, I have become supportive of accepting the MBLC grant, allowing the Jones Library to do a much needed renovation and expansion. I want to thank the library trustees the director, the staff, and the various consultants for working through the many questions that have been asked and the hours that have been spent providing the answers to those questions. In addition to that, the trustees have modified their plan to include significant sustainability measures, though they're not even subject to the net zero energy bylaw. And, but I must say, and I want you to make sure you hear this message loud and clear. Let me state it without equivocation, that as long as I have anything to say about it, there will be no more money than what we're voting tonight. This is all you get. And we will not favor you in future operating budgets. The town will not allow cost overruns. Others have spoken eloquently to the benefits of a public library and specifically our public library. So I'm not going to mimic their words, but I will state that it does address five of our six policy goals. And one could even argue that for the homeless and those who live in very small home quarters, it actually provides somewhat of a home. So, Finally, I'm going to add, because this has constantly come up. As many of you are aware, I've had significant involvement in looking at a future fire station and a DPW. And during the winter of 2018, before the town council even existed, I worked with seven other individuals to propose, propose a revised net zero, net zero energy bylaw, which passed town meeting with only two negative votes. So for me, one of the key issues is feeling strongly that we have a sound financial plan, not risk, sound, that will allow us to build a new elementary school and even with present limitations on spending, build a new fire and EMS station south of Amherst and place DPW in a seriously upgraded building and implement the zero energy bylaw. These investments are long overdue and the time to do them is now. So for me, this is part of investing, not just in our downtown, but in our town's entire future. Are there any other comments? Alyssa. Thank you. As I was hoping, pretty much everybody covered everything I could possibly think of. So thank you all for all your great thoughts associated with this. I just wanted to say two things. One is actually a direct quote from one of the many emails we received, which I thought summarized things extremely well from my perspective, which was that to refuse state funds in favor of a patchwork, piecemeal, and partial renovation makes no sense from a financial, environmental, educational, or social justice perspective. And I just want to add one other thing about the financial risk, which I do not believe exists here either. We are not expecting friends of the elementary school, friends of the DPW, or friends of the fire station to raise a single penny toward any of those facilities. Yet the Friends of the Jones Library has made a large commitment, has already seen quite a bit of results with that commitment, even without our vote. 
And I truly do believe in our community supporting that for all the reasons everyone else has expressed. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Then we are going to take the vote. And we're going to begin with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMond. No. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Abstain. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Jelani Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes, aye. The vote is 10 in favor, two opposed, one abstention, no absence. Thank you. We have one more vote, and that is to authorize the town manager to enter into the memorandum of agreement by and between the town of Amherst and the Jones Library Incorporated, acting by and through its trustees, whereby the Jones Library Incorporated agrees that it will exercise good faith and diligent efforts to raise the balance of the library share of $5,656,576 through grants, gifts, donations, and other fundraising efforts and deposit those funds with the town of Amherst in accordance with the memorandum of agreement. Is there a second? Ryan, second. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Kathy Shane. Um, yeah, the, I raised a couple of concerns about the memoration, memorandum of understanding. And so I just wonder during the finance committee meeting, and it's mainly on, I think there are ways it could be stronger. Um, and the rest, as Andy wrote in the report, the rest of the committee did not agree with me. They thought it was strong enough. But one of the one of the issues in paragraph seven of the rights and remedies is I think it would be possible to uh, put a share of the endowment in an escrow account as good faith money so that the language that says we can compel the library if needed to give us a share, we have an earmark share. And I know you would have to set up an ownership agreement, partial ownership agreement, and it's not to liquidate it. So I think having some collateral, actually have some good faith money up front would be good. And then the second um, is on the deed restriction. Um, when I suggested that the deed restriction be in perpetuity, I was told that maybe the library won't be there in the future. We might wanna move it after 30 years. We've been told this is a 50 year investment. So I think we could make the deed restriction for 50 years but at least make the town a party if there's a discussion about moving the library or liquidating it or selling it, that we get a return. This is not, we don't own the building. Um, so I think make the deed restriction stronger as well. Those two pieces. Are there any further comments from council? Dorothy Pam. I don't think putting a share of the endowment in an escrow account would be a wise way to go. Um, I believe that when we discussed deed restriction, uh, there were several options. There was the in perpetuity. I think there was 30 years, uh, there was 50 years. I don't see, I personally have no problem in putting a time limit of 30 or 50 years. If you think that that gives the town um, a stronger role in making such decisions. Um, I don't think it's necessary, but I don't think it would be hurtful. So that is my comment. The language in the agreement says initially 30 years, initially 30 years. The other thing is the reason 30 years was chosen is because we looked at various options. One is MBLC requires 20 years. The loan that we've been talking about has been discussed at 20 years and the CPA requires 30 years. We chose the furthest out, and that led us to the initially 30 years. Darcy? 
Just a question. Uh, um, it, it appears to me that there's nothing in the MOU that would prevent the library from coming back and making another capital request or going to seek more funding from CPAC. Is that correct? They may not seek after tonight. Once we have passed this bond bill, neither we nor the library can seek money from CPA, CPA for the library project because that is at that point considered supplanting. So the answer is no, they cannot. But they could come back and ask for, uh, put a capital request in. They can ask for any number of things. Whether we give it to them or not is another issue. They, you know, just like everybody else, they will continue to have capital requests as part of the Joint Capital Planning Committee work, but that's not considered part of the issue here. That's true of any operation. They can always ask. Is there any other questions about the MOU? Okay. Lynn, can, can I just, I, I'll raise it. Just on, they can't come back to CPAC for this project. Could they come back to say, we want to do the exterior of the building? It hasn't been pointed up, or would it be that still be this project? They have to be extremely clear that it was not part of this project to begin with or at any re renovation along the way. And even then, I think we'd have to get a serious reading from CPA. Our understanding is once this project is bonded, they cannot come back to CPA because that is considered supplanting. That's the read we got from the attorney. Are there any other questions? All right, then I'm going to begin with uh, Darcy Dumont. Mm -hmm. No. Reesmer is a yes. Haneke? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Aye. Evan Ross? Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes, with trepidation. <laughs> Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. No. Stanley Paul Milne. Yes. Elizabeth Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, the vote is 11, 4, 2 opposed, no abstentions, and nobody absent. I, I'm going to ask that we do at least one more item, and then we will make a decision as to whether or not we're going to go on with the last two items under action. The next item is um, an amendment to the town manager's public safety goal. And it sounds ominous, but instead of going there, I'm just going to ask Paul to speak to it real quickly. Thank you, Lynn. So um, uh, the uh, Community Safety Working Group continues its, its work. The deadline for their work that we had established previously was March 31st. They've now requested, uh, now that they have a consultant on board, additional time to work with the consultant and be able to deliver a report to me, uh, which which also obviously will be shared with the council. Uh, the, the consultants um, scheduled to deliver the report at the end of April. The working group would like a couple, a couple extra weeks to finalize their report. Um, and just so you know, like how does this fit in with the whole budget process, which has been a high priority. Um, I'm going to every meeting of the working group. I know where they stand. They're, they're working simultaneously with um, the consultant. So I, I think I have a pretty good sense of where uh, every, where they're headed on these things. 
Um, so they fully understand the deadline of, of when I have to submit material to the town council. So they're fully cognizant of that. This just brings their um, the the council goal and alignment, so they're not they're not going to be um, you know six weeks behind on their meeting their council goal. Okay, Dorothy. Um, Paul, I, I was shocked when I read the amount of the contract with the consultant. Can you tell me? why it's so expensive and what the committee and the town is getting from that yes so um so the um the, the committee put together uh, a bid request we used the inv inv invitation for bid and ifb process which is much which goes faster than an rfp and it, you choose the low bidder and so this was the low bidder on the project and um, the amount of work that was being requested, the amount of community outreach, which is very extensive, that's being requested, is all um, very intense work in a relatively short period of time. So I think that might have driven the, the, the value of this. Okay. Thank you. There were, and then just so you know, there were three bidders on this one higher one, and one that was significantly lower and just did not, no one felt like they would actually accomplish the project. Well, how many people are, is the consultant? Is it one person or a bunch of people doing the Oh, it's a, group, it's a group, yeah. The group, okay. Let me take another question too, but actually what I'd like to do is stop by putting a motion on the floor and that's to amend the town council performance goals for the town manager, July 1st, 2020. The June 30th, 2020 adopted a September 14th, 2020 by changing under policy goals section to community health and safety. The date results are presented to the town council from March 30th, 2021 to May 15th, 2021. And to amend the July 20, 2020 council directive previously adopted that the approval of the FY 2021 operating budget is made with the explicit understanding with the town manager that two upcoming anticipated vacant positions in the de police department budget not be filed filled until the town manager in consultation with the town council and residents of Amherst has fully explored alternative options of providing services and re presented the results to the town clown town council no later than March 31st, 2021. And it would now read to approve the FY 2021 operating budget is made with the explicit understanding with the town manager that two upcoming anticipated vacant positions in the police department's budget not be filled until the town manager in consultation with the town council and the residents of Amherst has fully explored alternative options of providing services and presenting results to the town council no later than May 15, 2021. Is there a second? Second, Steinberg. Okay, thank you. Um, and let me just say, the only thing that long motion does is change the date. It sounds like it changed it a lot more, but it just changes the date. Kathy. Yeah, I'm, I have, um, you answered one of the questions, Lynn, by the motion that we've pushed off um, what to do about the, the two frozen positions, unfilled positions are still unfilled. So my, my question is about timing. Um, you have to get the budget to us by May 1st. You're not coming with a recommendation out of all of this until May 15th, which is after May 1st. And we just heard a discussion earlier tonight on the regional school, whether that is there any possibility of saying part of one of those police positions becomes money in the school budget, which that decision would have to be made in the context of the school budget and the larger budget. So I just, and, and then by the charter, we can cut, but we can't move money around. So the, when, when the, when can finance or the council have a conversation that will be meaningful um, about all of this? If we, um, if you're not going to get a recommendation to the middle of May, but we're getting a budget on May 1st, and we've got 
issues on does that position become a mental health position? Could it be something in the school? You know, so I think you understand my question. The timing, I don't understand. Yeah, I'm afraid I didn't make myself clear. What they're, what they're requesting, they will make their decision before I have to submit my budget. They're asking for a couple of weeks to prepare the final report and the written report so they can spend some time gathering the documents, putting together the actual report. So what, what they will have to make, they have to make a decision before I submit my budget um in april so that the substantive matter will be done but the actual putting together the you know writing the final things writing the for the, the cover memo all that stuff they would like a couple little ex, a couple extra weeks i mean for this committee they're meeting weekly they're um very diligent everyone is showing up at every meeting um so um they recognize how much work they have to do in the next six weeks just to just to get to a final report so, okay, so so just to answer, so the the the, the sub, substance of the matter has to be done prior to May first because I I would like to incorporate the guidance that they're giving me um, or at least respond to it in the budget that I present to you. Kathy, did you have a further question? Well, I, I think that answers it. But you know, we are getting um, individual, but probably others, questions about you know when when is making a statement so you heard the high school students weigh in this, earlier this evening um so paul you'll have an answer with the committee that will be incorporated in your budget is what i think you're saying and then we will know about it as a council on may 1st right so you know i'm, I'm not saying that i'm going to incorporate everything the committee the working group recommends i'm saying they're going to give me their recommendation and i'll have something in the budget um that addresses this, I mean, we're anticipating that already. Okay. Okay, Alyssa. So yeah, so following up on that, so if I'm understanding that correctly, you know, and, and we do, we understand all the words that you've been saying here, but we won't have the justification for the decisions you make for the document for May 1st, because we're not going to all the community safety working group meetings and we won't have their report and we won't have heard all their discussions. So we won't get those until two weeks after we've received what, what recommendations you may have incorporated into the budget. So you'll just have extra text to write and won't be able to say, go look at their report because you won't have it yet, but you'll still be able to explain why you're doing what you're doing as you do every year with the budget. It's just, it's unfortunate, but it's, it can be compensated for by other text in the budget. So that's something then we'll know that and we'll just have to think about as everything's all connected, of course, it's not all siloed, is that we can focus on some other parts of the budget potentially in our discussions. And then as we get closer to the time that that report's available, then we'll be able to make more sense of all of it. And as you say, it may well be that you don't actually incorporate everything in this particular year's budget. And then we'll have a lot of questions about why that may or may not be the case. Specifically, on the, you know, it feels kind of funny to still be fixing something we did last July and like updating something in the past when it's almost a year later now. But when we talk about filling the vacant positions, I believe that the words we keep using here now that we're further along do actually mean that technically you could fill those two positions on May 16th. I don't want you to do that. So, so how is it that we that we are clear in our minutes? I just want to put something in our minutes. I don't have to can't change the motion, but I want to put something in the minutes that you either commit or don't commit to not filling those positions on May 16th, because as Kathy said, we won't have had the conversations we had imagined we might be able to have prior to them. Yeah, uh, you can add to the minutes that we will not be adding those positions May 16th or any or any time after, soon thereafter. It takes a long, it's a long process to go through a hiring process. We have not initiated the hiring process at all. So we're not sitting there waiting with the engines idling. Nothing has, has begun on any of that, on that hiring process for those two positions. So in that, you, you know, from your prior, prior experience that, that that's a months long process if it were to begin. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mandy Ja. Thank you. So I've heard the words you've said, Paul, <laughs> about um, going to the meetings, knowing that they have a deadline of May 1 or sometime before that, so you can get it into the budget on May 1. Um, but you have to submit a budget on May 1, even if they don't happen to quite be done May before that to get you to the budget. Um, and, and 
I don't know how confident we are that 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 will that part will be ready even if the report isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'm asking for is I believe there's state law language. I know people have mentioned we can't raise a budget ourselves. We can't raise numbers ourselves. Um, we can only reduce. But I think there's state law language that says something about um, in agreement with the manager um, about some stuff like that. And so I guess I would ask for a not, not necessarily a commitment, but a recognition that if for some reason the community safety working group just is not ready in order in time for you to be able to submit your budget on time on May 1 to be able to get their recommendations or whichever of their recommendations you're intending to put in your budget by May 1 when you submit it, that you're willing to re look at and consider sort of that 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 one provision in state law that allows us to raise that budget with your consent based on some of that um, so so that we're not stuck with something that we just can't go back and do. Yeah, no, so that that's true. Um, I mean, a budget isn't just one line item. It's a it's a it's a it's the entire budget with the library and the, and the schools all put together as a package. And so all those things fit together very we, we have to have that be balanced when I give that to you. So, you know, the council can certainly provide feedback and, and obviously any feedback that the council provides, I'll give the most serious consideration, but it's important to recognize that it's a bigger budget issue, um, not just one line item. Um, you know, I think, you know, the council has articulated its um, goals. Um, and so I'm trying to build the budget around the goals that the, the council has articulated. Um, so um you know yes obviously i work for you and we have, we have this conversation okay are there any other questions on this okay then uh we're going to vote on the motion that's been made and seconded we're going to start with greasemer and i vote aye uh mandy johanneke aye dorothy pam aye Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Kara Schwartz. Aye. Shalini Balnum. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Passes unanimously 13 0 0 0. All right. There's no good solution here. We have two other agenda items on the action side. We don't do them tonight, we do them next week. Next week's agenda doesn't look a whole lot better, but I'm looking to see what I can eliminate from it. Um, so, um, I would like to um, at least see if we can discuss the zoning bylaw 10.2 related to associate members of the planning board. I wrote you a memo on this. Basically, I outlined two options, I mean, three options in that memo. Uh, one is to ask CRC to name or to recommend names of residents to be associate members for the planning board. A second is to change the bylaw and get rid of the language that allows for associate members. And the third is don't change the bylaw and don't ask CRC to forward uh, recommended names of residents to be appointed to the planning board. And the reason this comes up is because every time we get to the planning board uh, appointments, somebody raises gee could we have some associates well guess what we're getting ready to have planning board appointments again and in discussion with the chair of crc it was decided that we should have this discussion before it comes to the council for the planning board appointments so the floor is open at about what we want associates or don't want associates etc dorothy I would suggest that we do not want to have associates and that all members of the planning board should be equal. 
คะอืม we haven't had associate members on the planning board since I think uh, 2000 or 2001 um, I don't think they're particularly necessary but I also like the idea that if uh, at any point the planning board began to think they were necessary we wouldn't have to go through this process again so I think we should just leave things alone and not appoint anybody unless the planning board wants them appointed. Evan Ross. Yep, I just wanted to uh, add to this discussion. Not only have we um, not had associates to the planning board, even though technically there's a provision in our bylaw that allows it, um, there's never been any expression by the planning board that they feel that they would benefit from associate members or that they need them. There's really only been one time that I can think of where possibly an associate would have been useful, but that was because um, we as counselors needed to uh, get our butts in gear and fill some vacancies, uh, which we then did um, pretty quickly. Um, and I also want to mention that this did come up um, briefly for discussion in a CRC meeting and uh, Director of Planning Chris Brestrup um, indicated that she did not feel as though the planning board needed associate members. And so I think there's, um, I don't think that we should be appointing associate members um, because it seems like the only people who ever feel like they are necessary are counselors in the midst of an appointment, um, specifically when they feel as though their preferred candidate is not being recommended to appointment. Um, that's the only time it's been brought up um, and by, di by different people. Um, and so they don't seem necessary. I don't know if I agree with Pat that we should leave the option in but not fill them or if we should say, you know, we don't, no one seems to think we need unless just get rid of them. I'm sort of agnostic on that, um, but I'm not agnostic in thinking that I don't think that we should be moving to fill those positions, at least not now. Thank you. Jeremy? I would put this to uh, this question to the planning board and see, uh, I did hear from one planning board member not naming that um, they felt that you know, it is, it takes a while to understand zoning and all the issues in planning board and to have somebody. So sometimes we lose experienced people and we bring in new people. And so the idea was that what is going to strengthen the planning board. And if it means we hold on to people who are experienced and bring in a new person, we don't want to lose the new person because that new person has amazing skills also that that would be a way that we can bring in new people and have them in integrated. But that's just, I still feel the question, I would be interested in hearing. And yes, Chris did say that she didn't feel there was a need, uh, but I would still like to hear from the planning board if indeed that is something that would be useful, helpful to them. And yeah, that's my position. Mandy Jo, in any of your conversations with the planning board, have you had that conversation? Um, no, um, because this was, as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, this was something that was brought to my attention by a committee member at CRC and I brought it to yours at the next agenda setting to be discussed and it's on here. So I have not, um, That I guess that would be a fourth option would be to refer the question of, or essentially ask the planning board whether they would like us to recommend associate appointments. Okay, that's absolutely not a fourth option. Kathy? Um, I, I think what Pat said, I agree with. Um, my feeling is leave, don't change the bylaw, leave it as an option. And as Shalini was saying, the potential is there that it might be useful, even if it's not necessarily from the planning staff's point of view. I heard from at least one resident who said they'd be interested in being on the planning board, but not going on as a full member. They'd want to be an understudy for a while so that they had time to watch it in action and learn from it. And that's what has been done with ZPA. So just because we haven't used it, doesn't mean we might never want to use this. So I'm not saying do it this year, but I think leaving the option open that um, it could be useful if you, um, and you know, so this person really did say, I would, 
I would apply if there was an associate member option. I'm not going to apply if it's a full member option because I don't want to hit the ground without um, a year of of listening, watching. So, so having heard that, I thought there is a potential value, even if we are not planning on doing it this year. Uh, Darcy. There you go. Um, yeah, I, uh, I uh, think that we really, I personally want to see all the options available. Um, if there are folks willing and able to serve as associate members, um, that seems like a big, a good possibility to be able to let them start to get experience. Um, so I know we haven't done it in the past, um, but I don't see why we would want to cut off that possibility, um, even though we haven't used that option. And it, it, it makes me feel uh, uncomfortable that we are um, discussing this now when we, we uh, you know, know some of the applicants for the current planning board openings. Um, just feels kind of uncomfortable uh, to be talking about. Um, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so I don't know any of the applicants for the planning board, so I feel like I'm missing something, but um, the, there's a nuance here, which is associate, by Mass General Law, associate members of the planning board can only be impaneled for a special permit hearings, as I understood, or first special permit cases, the planning board really doesn't deal with special permits, or they only deal with special permits when they're in association with site plan review. So if more specifically, there is something called special permit planning, SPP, but it's actually very rarely used. But most of the special permits are always in association with site plan review. So in a way, it doesn't make any sense because it can't, they're heard at the same time. So you can't be an associate for part of the hearing and not for the other part. The other nuance is that the state, the Commonwealth has made it much easier for um, planning board members who cannot physically be in the room or physically be in Zoom for, for hearings to participate. So there's both the Mullen rule, which allows you to miss a meeting and therefore you're allowed to miss a meeting make up by watching the video and or you can participate remotely, which are, these are things that happened over the last, I don't know, 12 years. So I personally don't see the need for associate member because of the fact it's restricted to special permits and also because there's other ways of the sitting planning board members to participate. Okay, Alyssa? So as is my want, I guess I get to say it more bluntly than Steve did. The people who think that this is like a backup plan, like zoning board of, so like, <laughs> I see how tired I am? Like the ZBA associates, they didn't read the memo. And the candidates who think that they wanna do that also didn't read the memo. Because as Steve just pointed out, it's very clear in the memo, which was not clear the last five times we talked about this as a town council, that they can't do any of the things that we normally think of associates as doing. They can only do this one tiny thing that we almost never do. So there is zero point in appointing them because they won't be sitting at meetings. They won't be doing anything unless they're delegated exactly the way it says in mass general law. These are nothing like ZBA associates. They don't get to do any of the other things. ZBA associates are exactly like ZBA members, not at all a fact for planning board. So what I would like to see us do to dispose of this once and for all is to refer it to the, and again, we only got this this morning. So let's be fair to ourselves. We've been reading library things for weeks. Um, is to refer it over to the planning board and say, do you see a reason to leave it in? Or do you see a reason to just go ahead and combine this with another hearing we're already having to just get rid of it? 
so that we can stop having this conversation where we're talking past each other, where people are saying, but I want them to serve like backups when legally they can't be backups. So let's either get rid of it or leave it in there so we can keep having the argument. But let's ask the planning board what they think of that. And like I said, it could be combined with another joint hearing with the CRC about a million other things and just be a shorter topic. Uh, Dorothy? We have to remember they're not meeting behind closed room in closed doors. I went to planning board meeting after planning board meeting for over a year or so. Anyone can go to the meeting, anyone can watch the Zoom, anyone can watch the recorded session, anyone can get access to the materials. The only thing that um, I was not able to do was to go on a site plan review visit. And these people wouldn't be allowed to do that either. So I don't see, if you wanna learn what the planning board does, it's easy to do if you're crazy enough to wanna to put the time in. Uh, that's it. For yourself, Dorothy. <laughs> Um, sorry, it's late. Uh, I'm going to suggest that I contact the chair of the planning board and the chair of CRC and that they have some kind of discussion about this and that for the time being, we do nothing unless I hear a motion from the floor. Dorothy, Darcy? No, that was, that was yes. That's okay, done with that item. Uh, <laughs> Mandy has a hand up. Yeah, Mandy, I'm sorry. Now, I, I was just going to give some timing of we there's a possibility that, you know, the the hearing on the moratorium will be in late May. Um, okay. I think it's May 19th. Um, so there's a little bit of time to be able to if this if the planning board wanted to take action on the zoning bylaw to be able to try and notice it for the same night to save some time. Got it. All right. Um, do we want to plow through one more? All right. This is a recommendation that came from CRC. I'm going to call on George to talk about the recommendation. I'm now serving on CRC, which I'm really excited about. I'm sorry, GOL. It's all right. It's, that's okay. Uh, I'd love to get out from under GOL, but uh, so yes, this came from GOL and it looks like you all want to deal with it tonight. I was shaking my head no, but that's all right. Um, I don't want to repeat what's in the report. The report spells out um, the arguments pro and con. Uh, essentially, I think what would be helpful then if we're going to talk about it tonight is to put the proposed bylaw up on the screen so people can see it. Um, if we now, have Would you put the proposed rule of procedure 10 up Thank on you. the screen? Thank you. Rule of procedure is correct. Um, and so this was um, before uh, GOL and um, we had dealt with it in two different meetings and uh, it was passed four to one. And as I said, the arguments pro and con are in the report, which hopefully you all read. The only point I would make is that I voted with the majority on this, not because in fact I support it. I really don't know at the moment, I'm of, of a number of minds, but I felt that it was important that it come before uh, the council and that we have a discussion. Um, and so um, there it is in front of you. And I think it's time for people to uh, speak on what their positions are. Um, I myself have my questions, but I'm gonna hold them off for the moment. Again, just repeating that I voted in the majority, it was four to one um, to send this on to the council, primarily because I felt it's something we need to talk about. And let me just say, this is the first time, it's a discussion only, I'm going to limit this discussion to 20 minutes. Okay, the clock is 10.37. Kathy. Oh, you're muted, Kathy. I totally support this. I'll be really short. And I think it's consistent with what Oka had come up with. And I particularly like the, as long as a member is an active contributing member of the board or committee, you know, that we're not giving tenure to people who just are sitting in a seat. Um, but the notion that each of these positions and the finance people 
core residents have actually said it takes them a while to figure out what's going on so that um, putting in the time is worth it if you know you can continue but you would like them to be active so i i think this would be a great addition to our rule steve schreiber so i'm exactly the opposite i'm totally against this unless we're willing to do uh, a metric that has other qualifications, education, experience, where you live, et cetera. So I'm a believer in affirmative action where everybody gets an equal chance at positions. And I don't believe, I think this is anti-affirmative action. So I think that once your term is expired, then your term is open to anyone. So we can definitely say you, you know, under experience, you should put down the fact that you have experience on this planning board and this is what you've done, but that experience shouldn't be weighed any more heavily than somebody else, uh, any other community member in Amherst. One other comment is there's confusing language at the very beginning that if you've completed a first term, we have people that are serving terms of one year or two years, so we should be clear about what that means, but in any case, I think we could definitely develop a score sheets, just like we're doing for the OPM, you know, for the elementary school, in which this would be one of them. But absent that, absent our willingness to do that, I don't think we should single out a particular characteristic and give that weight. Evan. Uh, so a couple things. Um, I'm not 100% sure where I fall on this. Um, it largely mimics what was in the adopted um, OCA internal policy for OCA, um, which uh, when we talked about that, I made clear was very much a compromise language between sort of two viewpoints um, that we felt like the language that OCA adopted um, was a compromise. This isn't exactly the OCA language. Um, OCA's language was taken directly from the town's appointed committee handbook. I think sections 2.3 and 2.6 maybe. I'd have to check the top of my head. So I guess I do have one question about why this language, um, why the, the changes that are here, why they are here and why they are different than what's in the appointed committee handbook. So that's point number one. Um, point number two, is that uh, I think the language is a little confusing because when I first read um, a second or third term for at least six years, I was reading as a second six-year term or a third six-year term where I think you're really talking about six cumulative years. So I think the language needs to be cleaned up and clarified a bit. Um, I'll say that regardless of whether we adopt this or not, I don't think it belongs in section 10 of rules of procedure. Um, it's not about council committees. Um, Really, and so um, it is again about committees of the town, but it just feels a little bit different to me. Um, I'm not quite sure where it goes. And then the last thing I wanted to say is, um, I think that if we're going to delve into appointments like this, we need to also look at other sections of the appointed committee handbook. Um, so for instance, we there's a rule in the appointed committee handbook that no one should be appointed to um, more than, uh, no more than two permanent committees at a time. Um, do we have that rule as well? And so I'd actually like us to take a pause on this and maybe ask GOL to look at the appointed committee handbook more broadly and see if we want to incorporate more aspects of that into our rules or if this is the only one. Because to me, it doesn't make sense to just pull this one out when there are actually other things that have also been discussed. Um, I know in OCA when we were looking at appointing to the ZBA and we had someone who already served on Board of License Commissioners, there was a question of, okay, so that's a second permanent committee. Um, there's been questions about, are we okay with people serving on both Planning Board and ZBA? There's no rule against that. And so I actually think there's broader questions about appointments that I'd like to see um, GOL delve into a little bit if we're opening this book, because I think it's a broader conversation than just this this one section of the appointed committee handbook. Darcy. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with Evan. It makes sense to look more broadly, but um, I do think that the issue about uh, term limits should probably be um, decided first because of the fact that it's time sensitive with the upcoming uh, um, appointments. 
So anyway, um, the issue came on referral from CRC, um, and I I had yeah. our. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. It was from GOL. No, Lynn, she's correct. It was actually referred to oh, us. I see. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. That's go ahead, Dark. Yeah. yeah, I I had argued um, that it was a full council issue, so I am glad that it's now before the full council. Um, there are really two issues, uh, whether we should have a unified policy um, regarding term limits for the council regarding reappointment, reappointment to the three committees, instead of allowing each committee to determine its own procedure. The second issue is the policy itself, whether we agree that incumbent members of the planning board Zoning Board of Appeals and resident members of the Finance Committee should receive a preference in reappointment based on their having gained expertise and experience for up to six years when the balance would turn in favor of preferring newcomers. Um, with regard to the substance of the proposal, uh, as Evan said, it's in large part the former OCA rule. Um, the, the, OCA rule didn't specifically say six years, but that was something that um, we, had, we had added um, two three-year terms, meaning, meaning six years. Alyssa had suggested that and um, the committee agreed. So, um, but I added the actual word six years. Um, the term limits uh, policy is basically that of OCA, the current GOL and um, the current GOL policy, that is, and the historic rule in the town manager handbook. So, um, and just what we've done historically in, in Amherst. It it's, it's, it's set up so that it balances the need for new faces on our committees with the need for experience and the wish to honor the commitment of volunteers who are willing to continue serving. So um, I uh, would argue that our committees of the council should not have different policies regarding term limits, um, basically because it doesn't make sense. With a unified council procedure, committees won't be jockeying to change their internal rules in order to ac accomplish a particular outcome. Darcy, um, time is up. My time is up. That was yes. three minutes. Yes. Could I please finish since it's my proposal? Sure. Um, in this case, we have three committees that have made appointments since we started. All three came up with different procedures. When the planning board appointments moved from the former outreach communications and appointments committee to the CRC, CRC changed the rule regarding giving preference to incumbents right before um, a particular planning board member would have been reappointed. There was a major uproar because he was one of a minority of two on the seven member board who had historically opposed unfettered downtown development. Because of the new rule, that member was allowed to be ousted. That the issue that you're raising is not the issue on before the council tonight. Oh, I I think it absolutely is, and I I insist on. I'm that. sorry, but it's not. This is the um, only issue I was asked to put on the agenda. The issue you're raising is not on the agenda. This is the this is the actual issue. This is the no. issue. This and is now the other issue. member of the minority, Janet McGowan, is up for reappointment soon. And the chair of the CRC has made it clear that she wants the ability. I have a point of order. This, this, yeah, this is um, way out of line. This is not out of line. This is exactly what the discussion has been in CRC. A point of privilege. Thank you. I'm sorry, Councillor Dumont just referred to me as having an opinion that I have not ever stated. Um, I would ask that, or was going to imply potentially about some sort of statement I've made that I may not have stated and I'd ask her to refrain from doing so. Well, I guess I would just ask that um, 
Let me uh, my, my understanding was that your opinion that was stated at the, at the GOL meeting was that you argued that you should not be bound um, by the choices of a former council and you should be able to vote for vote to replace the members of the planning board with the people that you want on the planning board. And if that's incorrect, I invite you to correct me. Sandy Joe, would you like to make another statement? Yes, I would. Um, I will address that issue only. Um, I have never made a statement regarding any potential appointment to a direct individual or non-individual regarding the upcoming appointments as I spoke in GOL regarding my opinion on this potential rule. To imply that any opinion on this rule is to be considered um, as an opinion on any potential applicant to the upcoming C, uh, planning board or zoning board of appeals appointment CRC will be making is an incorrect implication that I absolutely refute. I, I'm going to go back to a point of order as well. This motion or this piece in front of us is strictly about term limits. It is nothing in absolutely Nothing was sent to me that dealt with the way in which different committees do the selection of the people they're advancing to the council. So I don't, we are not discussing that item. That item is not on the agenda and therefore it is not on the table for discussion. The only item on the table for discussion is the one on the screen. Evan, do you have your hand up still, or do you have another comment? That, uh, that, that, was, that was accidental. Okay. Andy. So I um, thank you for the motion on the screen. I um, feel like Steve that um, it said earlier that uh, there's a question of uh, making sure that the um, committees that are doing the screening are looking at bringing forward to the council the best qualified, most diverse um, candidates possible. And uh, the experience that somebody has from having served um, previously, um, while appreciated, is just one of the criteria. Um, certainly getting diversity, which is a, a value that we've talked about many times and Steve mentioned is a value. Um, but there are also unique expertise that could be of great value. If, for example, there was nobody who was an architect or had um, any experience um, in, with architecture, and uh, there was somebody who came along with that kind of spec, um, expertise, and it was really felt that by a board that it was needed, whichever board it may be, um, the same thing could be true of uh, finance, uh, committee or anything else, then uh, the appointing um, committee should be able to look at that criteria and uh, the uh, uh, idea that you're going to say that there's a presumption of reappointment not only um, stops that from being considered, but it even stops the applicant who has those attributes of diversity or special qualifications from even coming before the committee because there's no reason that they would apply. Alyssa? So we have a fundamental misunderstanding here. This is not a term limit proposal. That, that's not what these words say. 
That is not what these words say. That might be what somebody's goal was, but that's not what this is. This is one amongst, as we've been discussing here, of several criteria for whether or not someone's going to get reappointed. There is no hard and fast term limit in here at all. A term limit is a piece, is a set of words that says you can't be appointed after X period of time. That's a term limit. Those words don't appear here anywhere. They don't appear in the appointed committee handbook. They don't appear in the OCA. They don't appear in any of the committees the town council's worked on. Let's be clear. The appointed committee handbook, the 2011 version, please, not the 2005 version, is a standing document. It is not something we threw out because now we're a town council. It is a standing document that applicants look to and the town manager largely follows. Remember that the town manager almost entirely reappoints every single person who asks to be reappointed by and large. We don't question that. We have encouraged him to think of things more our way, but we can have our own separate process that is different than his, which is different than how life used to be. How life used to be is we all worked from the same set of criteria, which was the appointed committee handbook. I appreciate the attempt that was made here to clarify so that we're not having this argument about people. I really appreciate that we're trying to do it in a hypothetical way. And I think we are at the right stage of the year to be able to do it in a hypothetical way. Unfortunately, we have a lot of other time pressures. And I think that the wording here needs to go back to, as Evan mentioned, the OCA work, which I was satisfied with because it was pretty close to the appointed committee handbook. This wording is sloppy. It says for at least six years, why would we suddenly start saying, oh yeah, planning board, you don't really know what you're doing until seven years, seven or eight. Like, that's not where we're going with this. So we need to perhaps say up to six years before you start kicking into the idea of the newcomer. And it does need to be part of that other healthy member body criteria. It is not the only consideration. I appreciate what this was attempting to do. It is not a term limit. That's not what this says. If that's the goal, we need different words in it. So maybe the idea is it goes back to GOL Everybody who's working on appointments has heard this conversation and knows that they're going to have to make a justification when they bring their recommendations forward to the town council. I'm just going to point out that we only have two minutes left of the 20 minutes we're going to devote to this. Shalini? Hmm. Um, I'm, I just had a question that I wanted to pose for all of you, and I don't think we're at the time to discuss it, but in my mind, I'm thinking that, okay, our goal, our intention is to do whatever the appointment should enhance and strengthen the planning board. That's the goal, right? And so as others have mentioned, if somebody comes with a unique set of skills, we should not be not taking them, even though this doesn't say, it says it's a preference to reappointment of people. But but my question to you all is that um, wh why is it that we need to give preference in a committee to people because they've served and we should reappoint them? Whereas as counselors, we go out for elections every two years or three years. And so there's no preference for us, so why are we suggesting that for committee they work so hard and we should give a preference to people who've been there for three years? I mean, I of course we're grateful for everyone who's working and everything, but and that's a quite and I haven't made up my mind, but this is just my thinking. So I wanted to hear other people's perspective on that. That why are we thinking that because they work for three years we should give them uh, the preference? Okay. Um, we've now spent 20 minutes on this. I'm willing to spend more time if people want to continue to speak. Um, but then I don't want people complaining about how long the meeting went. Um, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Is it up because you wanted to say something more? Shalini, same thing. Mandy Jo. Thank you. I will not say everything I would say, but I do want to put a couple things out there from all the conversations I've had within CRC within GOL that I've heard from OCA. It has become clear to me that members of the Council understand the word preference 
differently. And that is a very big problem if you're going to put and adopt a rule that uses the word preference. Because if we understand it differently, then the people reading it that are trying to apply for a position will understand it differently. And this argument will still come up year after year after year um, because it will be understood differently. And, and that is one of the biggest reasons um, I can't support this as worded completely. Um, I, I will, the report indicated some of my things. I will save responses to Councillor Dumont and some of my other opinions for a further conversation. Okay. Dorothy? I agree with Alyssa. This is not a term limits measure. Um, it was an attempt to maintain the ability of the planning board um, and the zone of, zoning board of appeals to perhaps have more than one view. I, and so it's probably not possible for us to do that. So I guess I'm gonna go and say with Alyssa, let's go back to that appointments book and just um, stick with that. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to Sarah Schwartz. You took, you had your hand up and now you took it down. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I think a lot of people know how I, I feel about this. And I would just like to make it very clear that when we first started trying to figure out how to appoint people, we felt like we needed some rules and some procedures. So at least it, you know, it, it, it looked like we, we had some thing to stand on when we recommended someone. I think we all remember the first time that we went through this. There was a lot of argument. Um, there were counselors who were saying that we had to respect um, people's, uh, the time that they had spent and their expertise on a committee. It was even suggested by a planning board member and by several counselors that 12 years might be the recommended amount of time for people to serve. Um, so it didn't come out of nowhere. In discussing this more in many different committees, it's become very clear that planning board and ZBA appointments are political. And it has been expressed by people that, that yeah, they are elected officials, they were elected by certain people who had certain goals. And it's only natural that, that, that an elected official would want to back up the goals of the people who elected them. It was even it has been said that you know to that point, there shouldn't be any messing around about justification. That's justification enough, and that there would be a preference for no rules. So that's really where this is coming from. I think it is some people's. Some people want to say, I think that we should make things at least look like you know we can recommend one person for these reasons, right? So that it seems fair to people who are applying that we have some rules about how we choose people and if you've been on a committee for a certain amount of time what you would need to do in order to stay on if you would like to this is what it, it comes down to so maybe we're not ready to decide this tonight but i think it's rich that a lot of the counselors who were fighting very much to say that originally they they wow, we really need this time served, you're now saying it doesn't matter. So I'd like to cut the, the baloney and just say, we know the issue on the table, okay? We know it. So maybe we just need to have a separate time when we all are fresh to just discuss whether or not we think there is merit in simply putting it out there that it is political and all of us, you know, if, if this is true, if everyone does feel like they, they need to represent who, elected them, that's fine. But that's really the issue. I don't want to pussyfoot around what we're trying to say here. This is what we're trying to say. So maybe we just say, let's table this for another day when we can talk about the merits of that. Okay, Steve, Evan and Darcy, each of you have spoken before. We are not voting on this tonight. Yeah. So um, I really take exception to what was just stated. I have absolutely no idea who elected me nor do I have any idea what the goals are of those people who elected me. I serve the entire town. I don't even serve District 4. I was elected by District 4 to serve the town. 
And my job is to use my best judgment to advance the, the help advance the town. I have no, I have no, um, there's nobody, <laughs> I'm not representing any particular group, but um, I still have a problem with this because essentially what we're saying, well, actually maybe, let me paraphrase this. Really what we're saying is that every appointment to the planning board, zoning board, um, resident members of the finance committee are six year terms. Why don't we just, we could just say that, which is so, you know, essentially that's, and I know that we all don't agree on what the word preference is, but we could say that everybody gets a six year term. And then after three years, we review to see whether or not we're gonna take you off in a way that's a much clearer message to send than this other way. So I don't think a six year term is a good idea. I think a three year term is a good idea. And I think that what I've said before, that after those three years, you, you're, you're reevaluated. So if you have a tough time defining preference, then good luck defining active and contributing. So I don't think that we'll agree on what that means either. So I like it not defined. I like it as clean three-year terms, period. Evan? Yep, real quick, uh, just building on what Mandy and Alyssa said, um, you know, the word preference is doing a lot of heavy lifting in this in two places. Um, Alyssa made clear that this is not a term limits rule. The idea that it, uh, preference is given does not mean that you are done after six years. It just means that there might be preference given to someone else. So I want to make sure this isn't mischaracterized as a term limits rule. But the other thing I want to make sure it's not mischaracterized as we, we did receive an email about this. Um, it said that the GOL voted for um, what they described as an auto renew um, or a rule that would auto renew. And I want to also make clear that this is not an automatic reappointment or an automatic renewal. The word given preference for reappointment does not mean you have to be reappointed. And again, much of this language was lifted from the appointed committee handbook. Uh, earlier I said 2.5, I mean 2.6, I found it, it's 2.5, the reappointment one. And I just want to add that the sentence that was eliminated from, uh, or it was not carried over that uh, comes after service may be appropriate is a committee member is under no obligation to accept reappointment, nor is the appointing authority obligated to offer reappointment. And so I wanna make it very clear for the public and the media that this is not an auto renew rule, that a preference for reappointment, we can debate that, but that does not mean that someone gets reappointment. And in fact, in the appointed committee handbook, it makes clear that there is no obligation for reappointment. Thank you. Okay, Darcy. Yeah, I would I would agree with what um, what Evan just said. Um, the one of the advantages to having the preference after the first term um, is just stability. Um, just um, taking to the extent possible the politics out of it so that we don't have to have a battle every three years. We can only have, we can, we can hold it off until the sixth year. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that leads to less chaos, less divisiveness, and just more stability in general as far as like not, not having to to uh, again have you know have a big battle over it every time, um, every three years. We don't we that that's not that's that's not something that we would be looking for. Thank you, uh, Steve. I believe your hand is up. Mandy Jo, you have another comment. Yeah, um, I think Councilor Dumont's comments just indicated what the problem with this language is because. Um, it is a political appointment and she just indicated that she doesn't want to battle every three years, but if you add the language to the appointed handbook that the that a person is not obligated to be offered reappointment. It still is a battle every three years. That's not going to th This language will not end that um, and to go to some of the things that have been said about my views on this. Um, I am the counselor that said I would prefer no rules at all because we're elected to make our own best judgment onto who the appointments are. Um, and we were elected maybe without any appointments, without any ideas, or maybe we were. 
Um, but there could be a time and a place where the planning board or the zoning board of appeals issues a permit or recommends a bylaw or doesn't recommend a bylaw that the town hates and that counselors run or candidates run on that issue and that issue specifically and they get elected to either affirm that one or not affirm that one and to replace candidates. I'm not saying any of us were elected to do that, but if that happens in the future and this language is here, you've just the, this language takes away each individual counselor's ability to use their own judgment and their own beliefs on what a good board, what a good committee is and whether that counselor believes that this person or that person would be the better person for the job at that time. Um, and that goes to things like whether there are differing opinions on there. And a lot of things has been said about that very first appointment and a lot of them things have been implied about a number of us counselors. I will just remind this council that I voted in favor of the OCA recommendation um, back in our very first planning board appointments three years ago, two and a half years ago, um, despite what many counselors have implied about potentially my vote or other votes. Um, if, I'm gonna take two more comments and then I'm going to stop. Uh, Dorothy, Pam, you have your hand up. Clarifying question. Doesn't, and I, and I may be, it's late, I may be totally wrong. Aren't some of the appointments of the planning board one year, two years, and three years? They are. Yeah, so nobody, I, I, I would like to see this thing changed. I like the idea of three-year terms. Um, but one-year terms do seem like kind of a waste unless the person really bombs out because they just barely, you know, got the, the know what they're doing then. A point of order on that one. Yeah. The charter requires three-year terms. The state law requires three-year terms. The only time it's not three years is if there is an appointment to fill an unexpired term, which the law says must be just for unexpired terms. The only condition. I, I, I agree with that. I didn't mean to mislead anybody. Okay. This is yeah. It. Okay. I just want to clarify that again. I also voted in, as manager said, in favor of the person we're talking about, and I find it offensive that you know every statement, everything we're doing is political by those standards because we are in politics. But to say out of the way that this is in some way, I mean, maybe you are making political decisions in that way but I don't th I don't think it's fair at all to assume that others are, and to make those accusations it's just so divisive and not helpful at all so let's just focus on what would make this process a good one for everyone and get the best planning board get the best committees on board and I know Alyssa will not like it but what is Northampton doing about this? <laughs> I want to see what other town I, I really don't know what is the best way to choose in my mind the best way to choose is based on the pool of candidates and I've always been consistent with that. It's not that I change flip flop. That's been my statement all through the different appointments that let's look at the pool of candidates and who is the best candidate. And I have voted on all sides, uh, just like Mandy Jo did. All right, uh, we're gonna move on. You can please take this down. Um, there are no appointments We're to committee liaison reports. Uh, is there anything further, Mandy Jo, or any questions to Mandy Jo? Just, just another clear, you know, just another to clear, clear, be clear that the the planning board and the CRC will hold a joint hearing on May nineteenth, that the Wednesday, um, at eight p.m. Mm. on the moratorium. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, elementary school building. And there's no update on that. The, the uh, well, the only update is that the advertisement um, request for bids is out. And today, uh, various people who are interested were visiting, doing site visits. So mm. that's good news that there is interest in um, bidding on the OPM. So th that doesn't close until the 19th of this month um, in terms of the, f the final 
thing and at which point Steve and the rest of us have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, Andy, and it, besides pointing out that the Finance Committee's calendar for reviewing the budget is in the packet, is there anything else? No. Okay, George. Nothing to add to the report. Kathy, anything from JCPC? You put a report, but I'm gonna ask that if there's any questions, it be for next week, not this week. Yeah, so there we did file, the committee filed the report. It went to Paul today and very late, I put it in the council packet, not expecting anyone would read it. And I did a one page set of highlights of some of the more interesting things, but that report is now formally filed. It's a recommendation of the committee to Paul and that it's done. Thank you. Uh, Town services. It was a great. <laughs> Um, we, in our, at our next two meetings, which is going to be this Thursday and then the 22nd, we'll be um, looking at the, um, the Pomeroy Village intersection uh, and hopefully making, making a decision or, a, you know, finalizing our recommendation possibly on the 22nd. Okay. Any liaison reports? Okay, uh, town manager's report. Any questions of Paul? Dorothy. Um, this was a question to Darcy on TSO. Oh, I'm sorry. Are, are you going to deal with the uh, Guilford's um, residential park streets and parking issue in any of those next meetings? Uh, it's not currently on the agenda. Okay. I just want to make sure I attend those meetings. So thank you. And Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Paul for the in the detail on the Board of License Commissioners and what they're doing. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see that they're taking on their new role in town government um, with gusto and and enacting a ton of regulations to help them do their job. I, I'm really good at cutting and pasting <laughs> from our great staff. That's okay. You're getting the news, the, you're getting the word out. Uh, Dorothy, did you have your hand up to ask Paul a question? Please unmute. Um, the section on um, the town IT and the meetings um, and information technology, um, I'm, I'm thinking of that and in relationship to a letter I received uh, that we, I guess we all received from Amherst Media and wondering if the town's relationship is changing with Amherst Media or there seems to be a, a problem. I'm just wondering where do things stand? So the town's relationship with Amherst Media has not changed, although um, we are doing a lot more with, with Zoom, the town IT staff is handling a lot of the work. Amherst Media still fulfills the uh, parts of its contract it's required to broadcast your meetings uh, finance committee meetings, school committee meetings, planning board meetings, etc. Um, there was some confusion, I think, about making sure um, that they had access uh, to the um, the INET as we were constructing a new INET. When we were doing the INET, it was anticipated that they would, by this point, have built a new structure, but that's not the case. So we're not going to we we will make sure that they are always connected. Um, so they can do the, the good work that they're um, that, that they're they're that, that, that they always do. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, then under the president's report, uh, I've placed in your uh, packet for tonight the memo regarding a hearing and the revote on the North Amherst Common, that will either happen on May 3rd or May 17th. I have to look at those two agendas, which are already heavy. Uh, are there any uh, other questions or future agenda items or counselor comments? Alyssa. I just wanted to add that when it comes to the North Common issue, I don't, agree with the town attorney's advice not mentioning our bylaw associated with parking. 
I appreciate that they were looking at our rules, but they didn't even mention the bylaw that we have associated with parking. And so I think that should be checked so that they can say, nope, actually that doesn't apply and that's why we're not quoting it. Or actually, yes, that is also part of it. And the other piece was associated with revenues. I believe we received some information in an email and I'd like it to be broken out in terms of revenues that's like paying for parking, but then the revenue that's also tickets for overstaying your welcome or for parking in the wrong spot, et cetera, because I know we have that broken out because we've talked in the past that we actually depend on giving people tickets, although we you know, try not to be mean to people, we actually do get substantial income from that. Again, for that hearing, when that's ready, we don't need the answers today. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, Lynn, I just have a uh, request. Um, so it's whatever we were April 5th. Um, the as soon as you know that we're going to do it, could we put the pictures and the memo that talks about parking up somewhere so people can see them? Because I found a lot of people didn't even know what we were um, making choices about. Um, there was not, there was just not broad knowledge of what we had in front of us as a decision it you know when we first saw it in november when it had gone to cpac it it had one configuration then it went to tso came out with two other versions but it wasn't so it j i just would like to see it up somewhere um we'll and up in, yeah we'll and then my other question is in our the bylaw that Alyssa referred to it says that all the abutters should be formally notified. And I would want to make sure the businesses um, know this is happening um, in, a, in a formal way, because I'm not sure that they knew that was up night too when I went back and looked at who was participating that night. So I know the BID went around and surveyed them, but I would just really like to know that they are aware that there'll be a, a hearing. Are there any other comments? Alyssa, you have your hand up. Okay. Um, thank you. Any other comments at all? Any future agenda items and counselor comments? Kathy. I'm just trying to lower my hand. Thank you. Okay. Seeing none, and we have no topics, no additional topics, executive session. I'm going to call the meeting adjourned at 1120. Thank you. <laughs>